Introduction. Mind power. The man who thought his way. Truly, thoughts are things and powerful things at that when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that individuals really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Thomas Alva Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the 13 steps which lead to riches. When this desire, or impulse of thought, first flashed into Barnes' mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to pay his railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey, where Mr. Edison's laboratories were located. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of people from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated. In other words, he went to East Orange on a freight train, he presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced he had come to go into business with the inventor. Years later, in speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Edison, Mr. Edison said, he stood there before me. Looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply, that he's willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events proved that no mistake was made. Just what young Barnes said to Mr. Edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought. Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to the person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage, doing work that was unimportant to Edison but most important to Barnes, because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the coveted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly suggested that, when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison. Moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He did not say to himself, oh well, what's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a sales job. But he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison and I'll accomplish this end if it takes the remainder of my life. He meant it. What a different story people would have to tell, if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination, his persistence in standing back of a single desire, was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and it often comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device, known at that time as the Edison dictating machine, later the Ediphone. His sales staff were not enthusiastic about it. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in an odd-looking machine which interested no one but Barnes and the inventor. 
Barnes knew he could sell the Edison dictating machine. He suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association grew the famous slogan made by Edison and installed by Barnes. The business alliance was a great success for more than three decades. Out of it Barnes made himself rich in money, but he did something infinitely greater. He proved that one really can think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes was worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it brought him two or three million dollars. But the amount, whatever it may have been, was insignificant when compared to the far greater asset he acquired in the form of the definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. He had no influence. But he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. With these intangible forces he made himself number one man with the greatest inventor who ever lived. Three feet from gold. Now let us look at a different situation and study someone who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches, but lost them, because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting, when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. An uncle of R.U. Darby was caught by gold fever in the gold rush days, and went west to dig and grow rich. He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the human brain than has ever been taken from the earth. He stayed to claim and went to work with pick and shovel. The going was hard, but his lust for gold was definite. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland, and told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery and had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear the debts. Then would come the big killing and profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and uncle. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junkman for a few hundred dollars and took the train back home. Some junkmen are dumb, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculations showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. That is exactly where it was found. The junkman took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into the machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors because of their faith in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although he was years in doing so. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Remembering that he had lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited from the experience in his chosen work by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because people say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby in his day was one of a small group of fewer than 50 individuals who sold more than a million dollars of life insurance annually. He owed his stick ability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Before success comes in anyone's life, that individual is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and, perhaps, some failure. When defeat overtakes a person, 
the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of people do. More than 500 of the most successful individuals this country has ever known have told me that their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. A 50-cent lesson in persistence. Shortly after Mr. Darby received his degree from the University of Hard Knocks and had decided to profit by his experience in the gold mining business, he had the good fortune to be present on an occasion that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean no. One afternoon he was helping an uncle grind wheat in an old-fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on which a number of black sharecropper farmers lived. Quietly, the door was opened, and a small child, the daughter of one of the tenant families, walked in and took her place near the door. The uncle looked up, saw the child, and barked at her roughly, what do you want? Meekly, the child replied, my mama say to send her 50 cents. I'll not do it, the uncle retorted. Now you run on home. Yes sir, the child replied. But she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work, so busily engaged, that he did not pay enough attention to the child to observe that she did not leave. When he looked up and saw her still standing there, he yelled at her, I told you to go on home. Now go or I'll take a switch to you. The little girl said, yes sir, but she did not budge an inch. The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper, picked up a barrel stave, and started toward the child with an expression on his face that indicated trouble. Darby held his breath. He was certain he was about to witness a horrible beating. He knew his uncle had a fierce temper. In those days, poor children, especially sharecropper children, simply were not allowed to exhibit such overt defiance. When the uncle reached the spot where the child was standing, she quickly moved forward one step, looked up into his eyes, and screamed at the top of her shrill voice, my mama's gotta have that 50 cents. The uncle stopped, looked at her for a minute, then slowly laid the barrel stave on the floor, put his hand in his pocket, took out a half dollar, and gave it to her. The child took the money and slowly backed toward the door, never taking her eyes off the man she had just conquered. After she had gone, the uncle sat down on a box and looked out the window into space for more than 10 minutes. He was pondering, with awe, the whipping he had just taken. Mr. Darby, too, was doing some thinking. That was the first time in all his experience he had seen a black child deliberately master a white adult. How did she do it? What happened to his uncle that robbed him of his fierceness and made him as docile? As a lamb? What strange power did this child use that made her master over this man? These and other similar questions flashed into Darby's mind, but he did not find the answer until years later, when he told me the story. Strangely, the story of this unusual experience was told to me in the old mill, on the very spot where the uncle took his whipping. Strangely too, I had devoted nearly a quarter of a century to the study of that same power which enabled a small, illiterate sharecropper's child to conquer a powerful figure of authority. As we stood there in that musty old mill, Mr. Darby repeated the story of the unusual conquest and finished by asking, what can you make of it? What strange power did that child use that so completely whipped my uncle? The answer to his question will be found in the principles described in this book. The answer is full and complete. It contains details and instructions sufficient to enable anyone to understand and apply the same force which the little child stumbled upon accidentally. Keep your mind alert, and you will observe exactly what strange power came to the rescue of the child. You will catch a glimpse of this power in the next chapter. Somewhere in this book you will find an idea that will quicken your receptive powers and place at your command, for your own benefit, the same irresistible power. The awareness of this power may come to you in the first chapter, or it may flash into your mind in some subsequent chapter. It may come in the form of a single idea or it may come in the nature of a plan or a purpose. Again, it may cause you to go back into your past experiences of failure or defeat and bring to the surface some lesson by which you can regain all that you lost through defeat. After I had described to Mr. Darby the power unwittingly used by the little child, 
he quickly retraced his 30 years of experience as a life insurance salesman and frankly acknowledged that his success in that field was due in no small degree to the lesson he had learned from the child. Mr. Darby pointed out, every time a prospect tried to bow me out without buying, I saw that child standing there in the old mill, her big eyes glaring in defiance, and I said to myself, I've got to make this sale. The better portion of all sales I have made, were made after people had said no. He recalled too, his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold, but that experience, he said, was a blessing in disguise. It taught me to keep on keeping on, no matter how hard the going may be, a lesson I needed to learn, before I could succeed in anything. This story of Mr. Darby, his uncle, the child, and the gold mine doubtless will be read by hundreds of men and women who make their living in sales. To all of these, I wish to offer the suggestion that Darby owed to these two experiences his ability to sell more than a million dollars of life insurance every year, an incredible feat in his day. Life is strange and often imponderable. Both its successes and its failures have their roots in simple experiences. Mr. Darby's experiences were commonplace and simple enough, yet they held the answer to his destiny in life, therefore, they were as important, to him, as life itself. He profited by these two dramatic experiences, because he analyzed them, and found the lesson they taught. But what of the person who has neither the time, nor the inclination to study failure in search of knowledge, that may lead to success, where and how is that individual to learn the art of converting defeat into stepping stones to opportunity? To answer these questions, this book was written. The answer calls for a description of 13 steps, or principles, but remember as you read, the answer you may be seeking to the questions which have caused you to ponder over the strangeness of life may be found in your own mind, which through some idea, plan, or purpose which may spring into your mind as you read. One sound idea is all that one needs to achieve success. The principles described in this book contain the best and the most practical of all that is known concerning ways and means of creating useful ideas. Before we go any further in our approach to the description of these principles, I believe you are entitled to receive this important suggestion. When riches begin to come, they come so quickly, in such great abundance, that one wonders where they have been hiding during all those lean years. This is an astounding statement, and all the more so, when we take into consideration the popular belief that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, and with little or no hard work. You and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research, analyzing thousands of people, because I too, wanted to know how wealthy people become that way. Without that research, this book could not have been written. Here take notice of a very significant truth. The Great Depression started in 1929, and continued on to an all-time record of economic destruction until sometime after President Franklin D. Roosevelt entered office. Then the depression began to fade into nothingness. Just as an usher in a theater raises the light so gradually that darkness is transmuted into light before you realize it, so did the spell of fear in the minds of the people gradually fade away and become faith. Observe closely that, as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy, and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles, your financial status will begin to improve, and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. One of the main weaknesses of the human race is the average person's familiarity with the word impossible. People know all the rules which will not work. They know all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful, and who are willing to stake everything on those rules. A great many years ago I purchased a fine dictionary. The first thing I did with it was to turn to the word impossible and neatly clip it out of the book. That would not be an unwise thing for you to do. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. The object of this book is to help all who seek it to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to success consciousness. 
Another weakness found in altogether too many people is the habit of measuring everything and everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. Some who read this will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They cannot think in terms of riches because their thought habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. These unfortunate people remind me of a prominent Asian who came to America when he was a student to be educated in American ways. He attended the University of Chicago. One day President William Rainey Harper met this young man on the campus, stopped to chat with him for a few minutes and asked what had impressed him as being the most noticeable characteristic of the American people. Why, the student exclaimed, your eyes. What does the typical Caucasian say about people of Asian descent? We refuse to believe, or we think odd, that which is not familiar, or which we do not understand. We foolishly believe that our own limitations are the proper measure of limitations. Sure another person's eyes may appear different, because they are not the same as our own. Millions of people look at the achievements of highly successful entrepreneurs, such as Henry Ford, after they have arrived and envy them, because of their good fortune, or luck, or genius, or whatever it is that they credit for the entrepreneur's fortunes. Perhaps one person in every hundred thousand knows the secret of entrepreneurial success, and those who do know, are too modest, or too reluctant to speak of it, because of its simplicity. A single event will illustrate the secret perfectly. One day, Ford decided to produce his now-famous V8 automobile engine, one of the most successful developments in the history of the automobile industry. He chose to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block, and he instructed his engineers to produce a design for the engine. The design was placed on paper, but the engineers agreed to a man that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gas engine block in one piece. Ford said, produce it anyway. But, they replied, it's impossible. Go ahead, Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed, no matter how much time is required. The engineers went ahead. There was nothing else for them to do, if they were to remain on the Ford staff. Six months went by, nothing happened. Another six months passed, and still nothing happened. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the orders, but the thing seemed out of the question, impossible. At the end of the year, Ford checked with his engineers, and again they informed him they had found no way to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford. I want it, and I'll have it. They went ahead, and then, as if by a stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. The Ford determination had won once more. 7. This story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum and substance of it is correct. Deduce from it, if you wish to think and grow rich, the secret of the Ford millions. You'll not have to look very far. Henry Ford was a success because he understood and applied the principles of success. One of these is desire, knowing what you want. Remember this Ford story as you read and pick out the lines in which the secret of his stupendous achievement has been described. If you can do this, if you can lay your finger on the particular group of principles which made Henry Ford rich, you can equal his achievements in almost any calling for which you are suited. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul. When poet William Ernest Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls, because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the universe in which this little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is itself a form of energy, and it is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds and influences us, in natural ways, to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we should know why it is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us, with great emphasis, that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts, that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us too, that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts we hold in our minds. And that by means which no one fully understands, these dominating thoughts, like magnets, 
attract to us the forces, the people, the circumstances of life which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that, before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But, being a poet, and not a philosopher, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little, the truth has unfolded itself, until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now almost ready to examine the first of the 13 steps to riches that underlie the think and grow rich philosophy. Maintain a spirit of open-mindedness, and remember as you read, that these principles are the invention of no one individual. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than 500 people who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts, people who began in poverty, with but little education, without influence. The principles worked for these individuals. You can put them to work for your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard, to do. Before you read about the first step to riches in the next chapter, I want you to know that it conveys factual information that might easily change your entire financial destiny, just as it so definitely brought changes of stupendous proportions to two persons to be described. I want you to know also that the relationship between these two individuals and myself is such that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, even if I had wished to do so. One of them was my closest personal friend for more than a quarter of a century. The other is my own son. The unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredit to the principle described in the next chapter, more than justifies this personal reference as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Many years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College in Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized the principle described in the next chapter with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appropriated it and made it a part of his own philosophy. That young man went on to become a distinguished member of Congress and an important figure in the national government. Just before this book went to the publisher, this you. S. Senator wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter that I have chosen to publish his letter here as a foreword to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I must state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean several years of labor and responsibility for you, but I am inherent to make the suggestion, because I know your great love for rendering useful service. You delivered the commencement address at Salem College, when I was a member of the graduating class. In that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state, and will be responsible, in a very large measure, for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College, and in that way, give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your many years of experience and association with those who, by their greatness, have made America the richest nation on earth. I recall, as though it were yesterday, the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself, no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year, and within the next few years. Every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do, to get started in life. You can tell them, because you have helped to solve the problems of, so many many people. If there is any possible way, that you can afford to render so great a service, may I offer the suggestion, that you include with every book, one of your personal analysis charts, in order that the purchaser of the book, may have the benefit of a complete self-inventory, indicating, as you indicated to me years ago, 
exactly what is standing in the way of success. Such a service as this, providing the readers of your book with a complete, unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues, would mean to them the difference between success and failure. The service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback and I speak from personal experience when I say, I know these earnest people would welcome the opportunity to receive your suggestions for the solution. You know the problems of those who face the necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money, people who must start at scratch, without finances, and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press, personally autographed by you. With best wishes, believe me, cordially yours, Jennings Randolph. What that commencement address had kindled in Senator Jennings Randolph as he was about to set out on adult life was his first real understanding of the enormous power of desire, the first step to riches. The burning desire to be, and to do, is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. Chapter 1. Desire. The starting point of all achievement. The first step to riches. When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down from that freight train in Orange, N.J., he may have resembled a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out the one consuming obsession of his life, a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a keen, pulsating desire that transcended everything else. It was definite. The desire was not new when he approached Edison. It had been Barnes' dominating desire for a long time. In the beginning, when the desire first appeared in his mind, it may have been, probably was, only a wish, but it was no mere wish when he appeared before Edison with it. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. People who later knew Barnes envied him because of the break that life had yielded him. They saw him in the days of his triumph without taking the trouble to investigate the cause of his success. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort, everything back of that goal. He did not become the partner of Edison the day he arrived. He was content to start at the most menial work, as long as it provided an opportunity to take even one step toward his cherished goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. During all those years, not one ray of hope, not one promise of attainment of his desire, had been held out to him. To everyone except himself, he appeared to be only another cog in the Edison business wheel, but in his own mind he was the partner of Edison every minute of the time from the very day that he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose. But he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life, and, finally, a fact. When he went to Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edison to give me a job of some sort. He said, I will see Edison and put him on notice that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will work there for a few months, and if I get no encouragement, I will quit and get a job somewhere else. He did say, I will start anywhere. I will do anything Edison tells me to do, but before I am through, I will be his associate. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. He said, there is but one thing in this world that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas A. Edison. I will burn all bridges behind me and stake my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. 
That is all there is to the barn's story of success. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his troops before the first battle, he said, you see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win, or we perish. They won. Those who would win in any undertaking must be willing to burn their ships and cut all sources of retreat. Only by so doing, can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win, essential to success. The morning after the Great Chicago Fire, a group of merchants stood on State Street looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide if they would try to rebuild or leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They reached a decision, all except one, to leave. Chicago. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, gentlemen, on that very spot I will build the world's greatest store, no matter how many times it may burn down. That was in 1871. The store was built. It became a towering monument to the power of that state of mind known as burning desire. The easy thing for Marshall Field to have done would have been exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marshall Field and the other merchants, because it is the same difference that distinguished Edwin C. Barnes from thousands of other young people who worked in the Edison organization. It is the same difference which distinguishes practically all who succeed from those who fail. Every individual who reaches the age of understanding the purpose of money, wishes for it. Wishing will not bring riches. But desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite, practical actions. First, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. Be definite as to the amount. There is a psychological reason for definiteness which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. Fifth, write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire, name the time limit for its acquisition, state what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your written statement aloud, twice daily, once just before retiring at night and once, after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel, and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions described in these six actions. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth. You may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. Only those who become money conscious ever accumulate great riches. Money consciousness means that the mind has become so thoroughly saturated with the desire for money that one can see oneself already in possession of it. To the uninitiated, who have not been schooled in the working principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six actions to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed 
despite his humble beginnings, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than one hundred million dollars. It may be a further help to know that the six actions here recommended were carefully scrutinized by Thomas A. Edison, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but necessary for the attainment of any definite goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or unthinking. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful completion of these six actions does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune, and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring, and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know, right here, that you can never have riches in great quantities unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. You may as well know also that every great leader, from the dawn of civilization down to the present, was a dreamer. Christianity became one of the greatest powers in the world because its founder was an intense dreamer who had the vision and the imagination to see realities in their mental and spiritual form before they had been transmuted into physical form. If you do not see great riches in your imagination, you will never see them in your bank balance. Never in the history of America has there been so great an opportunity for practical dreamers as now exists. The hardships of these recent tough and unsettled economic times have put many people back at square one. A new race is about to be run. The stakes represent huge fortunes which will be accumulated within the next few years. The rules of the race have changed because we now live in a changed world that definitely favors those who have had little or no opportunity to win under the conditions existing recently, when fear often paralyzes personal and economic growth and development. We who are in this race for riches should be encouraged to know that this changed world in which we live is demanding new ideas, new ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, new methods of teaching, new methods of marketing, new books, new literature, new features for the mass media, new ideas for entertainment. Back of all this demand for new and better things there is one quality which one must possess to win, and that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what one wants, and a burning desire to possess it. We have witnessed the death of one age and the birth of another. This changed world requires practical dreamers who can and will put their dreams into action. The practical dreamers have always been and always will be the pattern makers of civilization. We who desire to accumulate riches should remember that the real leaders of the world always have been individuals who harnessed and put into practical use the intangible unseen forces of unborn opportunity and converted those forces or impulses of thought into skyscrapers, cities, factories, airplanes, automobiles, and every form of convenience that makes life more pleasant. Tolerance and an open mind are practical necessities of the dreamer of today. Those who are afraid of new ideas are doomed before they start. Never has there been a time more favorable to pioneers than the present. True, there is no wild and woolly west to be conquered as in the days of the covered wagon. But there is a vast business, financial, and industrial world to be remolded and redirected along new and better lines. In planning to acquire your share of the riches, let no one influence you to scorn the dreamer. To win the big stakes in this changed world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers of the past whose dreams have given to civilization all that it has of value. It is that spirit which serves as the lifeblood of America, the burning desire to take full advantage of the wonderful opportunity, yours and mine, to develop and market our talents in a free land. Let us not forget, Columbus dreamed of an unknown world, staked his life on the existence of such a world, and discovered it. Copernicus, the great astronomer, dreamed of a multiplicity of worlds and revealed them. No one denounced him as impractical after he had triumphed. Instead, the world worshipped at his shrine, thus proving once more that success requires no apologies, failure permits no alibis. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across, and never mind what they say, if you meet with temporary defeat, 
for they perhaps do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage, went to work with what tools he possessed without waiting for opportunity to favor him, and now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He put more wheels into operation than anyone who ever lived, because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity, began where he stood to put his dream into action, and despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by that dream until he made it a physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Lincoln dreamed of freedom for the slaves, put his dream into action, and barely missed living to see a united North and South translate his dream into reality. The Wright brothers dreamed of a machine that would fly through the air. Now one may see evidence all over the world that they dreamed soundly. Marconi dreamed of a system for harnessing the intangible forces of the electromagnetic spectrum. Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every radio and television set in the world. Moreover, Marconi's dream brought the humblest cabin and the stateliest manor house side by side. It has made the people of every nation on earth backdoor neighbors. It gave the President of the United States the means by which to talk to all the people of America at one time and on short notice. It may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a mental hospital when he announced he had discovered a principle through which he could send messages through the air without the aid of wires or other direct physical means of communication. The dreamers of today fare better. The world has become accustomed to new discoveries. It has shown a willingness to reward the dreamer who gives the world a new idea. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Awake, arise, and assert yourself, you dreamers of the world. Your star is in the ascendancy. Worldwide economic uncertainty has brought the opportunity you have been waiting for. It has taught many people humility, tolerance, and open-mindedness. The world is filled with an abundance of opportunity the dreamers of the past never knew. A burning desire to be, and to do, is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. The world no longer scoffs at dreamers, nor calls them. Impractical. If you think it does, take a trip to Tennessee and visit the mighty dams and power plants of the Tennessee Valley Authority to witness what a dreamer president did in the way of harnessing and using the great water power of America. At one time, such a dream would have seemed like madness. You may have been disappointed, you may have suffered setbacks and defeat during hard economic times, you may have felt the great heart within you crushed until it bled. Take courage, for these experiences have tempered the spiritual metal of which you are made, they are assets of incomparable value. Remember too, that all who succeed in life get off to a bad start and pass through many heartbreaking struggles before they arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at the moment of some crisis, through which they are introduced to their other selves. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, which is among the finest works in all of English literature, after he had been confined in prison and sorely punished because of his views on religion. O. Henry discovered the genius which slept within his brain, after he had met with great misfortune and was confined in a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio. Being forced, through misfortune, to become acquainted with his other self and to use his imagination, he discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. Strange and varied are the ways of life and stranger are the ways of infinite intelligence through which human beings are sometimes forced to undergo all sorts of trouble and tribulation before discovering their own brains and their own capacity to create useful ideas through imagination. Edison, the world's greatest inventor and scientist, started out as a tramp telegraph operator. He failed innumerable times before he was driven finally to the discovery of the genius that slept within his brain. Charles Dickens began by pasting labels on blacking pots. The tragedy of his first love penetrated the depths of his soul and converted him into one of the world's truly great authors. That tragedy produced, first, David Copperfield, then a succession of works that made this a richer 
and better world for all who read his books. Disappointment over love affairs can have the effect of driving many to drink and others to ruin, and this because most people never learn the art of transmuting their strongest emotions into dreams of a constructive nature. This power of transmutation will be dealt with in detail later. Helen Keller became deaf and blind shortly after birth and for years could not speak. Despite her misfortune, she wrote her name indelibly in the pages of the history of the great. Her entire life served as evidence that no one ever is defeated until defeat has been accepted as a reality. Robert Burns was an illiterate country lad who was cursed by poverty and who grew up to be a drunkard in the bargain. The world was made better for his having lived because he clothed beautiful thoughts in poetry and thereby plucked a thorn and planted a rose in its place. Booker T. Washington was born in slavery, handicapped by race and color in the society in which he lived. Because he was tolerant, had an open mind at all times and on all subjects, and was a dreamer, he left his imprint for good on an entire nation. Beethoven was deaf, Milton was blind, but their names will last as long as civilization endures because they dreamed and translated their dreams into organized thought. Before passing to the next chapter, resolve yourself to kindle in your mind the fire of hope, faith, courage, and tolerance. Once you have these states of mind, and a working knowledge of the principles described in this book, all else that you need will come to you when you are ready for it. There is a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. You are never ready for a thing until you believe you can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. Jesse B. Rittenhouse has correctly stated this universal truth through these lines in his poem My Wage, I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more, however I begged at evening. When I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer, he gives you what you ask, but once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire. Only to learn, dismayed, that any wage I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. Desire outwits mother nature. As a fitting conclusion to this chapter, I wish to introduce one of the most unusual persons I have ever known. I first saw him many years ago, a few minutes, after he was born. He came into the world without any external, physical sign of ears, and the doctor admitted, when pressed for an opinion, that the child would likely be deaf and mute for life. This was long before the advent of the kind of reconstructive surgery that is commonplace today. I challenged the doctor's opinion. I had the right to do so. I was the child's father. I too, reached a decision and rendered an opinion, but I expressed the opinion silently, in the secrecy of my own heart. I decided that my son would hear and speak. Nature could send me a child without normal organs of hearing, but nature could not induce me to accept the reality of the affliction. In my own mind, I knew that my son would hear and speak. How? I was sure there must be a way, and I knew I would find it. I thought of the words of the immortal Emerson, the whole course of things goes to teach us faith. We need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. The right word? Desire. More than anything else. I desired that my son should not be deaf and mute. From that desire I never receded, not for a second. Many years previously I had written, our only limitations are those we set up in our own minds. For the first time I wondered if that statement were true. Lying on the bed in front of me was a newborn child, without the natural equipment of hearing. Even though he might eventually hear and speak, he was obviously disfigured for life. Surely, this was a limitation which that child had not set up in his own mind. What could I do about it? Somehow, I would find a way to transplant into that child's mind my own burning desire for ways and means of conveying sound to his brain without the aid of ears. As soon as the child was old enough to cooperate, I would fill his mind so completely with a burning desire to hear that nature would, by methods of her own, translate that desire into physical reality. All this thinking took place in my own mind, but I spoke of it to no one. Every day I renewed the pledge I had made to myself, 
not to accept this disability for my son. As he grew older and began to take notice of things around him, we observed that he had a slight degree of hearing. When he reached the age when children usually begin talking, he made no attempt to speak, but we could tell by his actions that he could hear certain sounds slightly. That was all I needed to know. I was convinced that if he could hear even slightly he might develop still greater hearing capacity. Then something happened which gave me hope. It came from an entirely unexpected source. We bought a Victrola, an old-fashioned phonograph. When the child heard the music for the first time, he went into ecstasies and promptly appropriated the machine. He soon showed a preference for certain records, among them it's a long way to Tipperary. On one occasion, he played that piece over and over for almost two hours, standing in front of the Victrola with his teeth clapped on the edge of the case. The significance of this L-formed habit of his did not become clear to us until years afterward, for we had never heard of the principle of bone conduction of sound at that time. Shortly after he appropriated the Victrola, I discovered that he could hear me quite clearly when I spoke with my lips touching his mastoid bone at his jawbone near where his ear canal would have been. These discoveries placed into my possession the necessary means by which I began to translate into reality my burning desire to help my son develop hearing and speech. By that time he was making stabs at speaking certain words. The outlook was far from encouraging, but desire backed by faith knows no such word as impossible. Having determined that he could hear the sound of my voice plainly, I began immediately to transfer to his mind the desire to hear and speak. I soon discovered that the child enjoyed bedtime stories, so I went to work creating stories designed to develop in him self-reliance, imagination, and a keen desire to hear. There was one story in particular which I emphasized by giving it some new and dramatic coloring each time it was told. It was designed to plant in his mind the thought that his disability was not a liability, but an asset of great value. Despite the fact that all the philosophy I had examined clearly indicated that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage, I must confess that I had not the slightest idea how this affliction could ever become an asset. However, I continued my practice of wrapping that philosophy in bedtime stories, hoping the time would come when he would find some plan by which his disability could be made to serve some useful purpose. Reason told me plainly that there was no adequate compensation for the lack of ears and natural hearing equipment. Desire, backed by faith, pushed reason aside and inspired me to carry on. As I analyze the experience in retrospect, I can see now that my son's faith in me had much to do with the astounding results. He did not question anything I told him. I sold him the idea that he had a distinct advantage over his older brother and that this advantage would reflect itself in many ways. We could notice that the child's hearing was gradually improving. Moreover, he had not the slightest tendency to be self-conscious because of his affliction. When he was about seven, he showed the first evidence that our method of servicing his mind was bearing fruit. For several months he begged for the privilege of selling newspapers, but his mother would not give her consent. She was afraid that his deafness made it unsafe for him to go out on the street alone. Finally, he took matters into his own hands. One afternoon when he was left at home with the servants, he climbed through the kitchen window, shinny to the ground, and set out on his own. He borrowed six cents in capital from the neighborhood shoemaker, invested it in papers, sold out, reinvested, and kept repeating this process until late in the evening. After balancing his accounts and paying back the six cents he had borrowed from his banker, he had a net profit of 42 cents. When we got home that night, we found him in bed asleep with the money tightly clenched in his little hand. His mother opened his hand, removed the coins, and cried. Of all things, crying over her son's first victory seemed so inappropriate. My reaction was the reverse. I laughed heartily, for I knew that my endeavor to plant in the child's mind an attitude of faith in himself had been successful. His mother saw in his first business venture a little deaf boy who had gone out in the streets and risked his life to earn money. I saw a brave, ambitious, self-reliant little businessman whose stock in himself had been increased a hundred percent because he had gone into business on his own initiative and had won. 
the transaction pleased me because I knew that he had given evidence of a trait of resourcefulness that would go with him all through life. Later events proved this to be true. When his older brother wanted something, he would lie down on the floor, kick his feet in the air, cry for it, and get it. When the little deaf boy wanted something, he would plan a way to earn the money, then buy it for himself. He would follow that pattern throughout adult life. Truly, my own son taught me that his abilities can be converted into stepping stones on which one may climb towards some worthy goal unless they are accepted as obstacles and used as alibis. The little deaf boy went through grade school, high school, and college without being able to hear his teachers, except when they shouted loudly at close range. He did not go to a special school. We were determined that he should live as normal a life as possible and associate with children with hearing, and we stood by that decision, although it cost us many heated debates with school officials. While he was in high school, he tried a hearing aid, but it was of no value to him. During his last week in college, something happened which marked the most important turning point of his life. Through what seemed to be mere chance, he came into possession of another hearing aid device, which was sent to him on trial. He was slow about testing it, because of his disappointment with the earlier device. Finally he picked the instrument up, and more or less carelessly placed it on his head, hooked up the battery, and lo, as if by a stroke of magic, his lifelong desire for normal hearing became a reality. For the first time in his life, he could hear practically as well as any person with normal hearing. Overjoyed because of the changed world which had been brought to him through his hearing device, he rushed to the telephone, called his mother, and heard her voice perfectly. The next day he plainly heard the voices of his professors in class for the first time in his life. Previously he could hear them only when they shouted at short range. He heard the radio. He heard the movies. For the first time in his life he could converse freely with other people without the necessity of their having to speak loudly. Truly, he had come into possession of a changed world. We had refused to accept nature's error, and, by persistent desire, we had induced nature to correct that error through the only practical means available. Desire had commenced to pay dividends, but the victory was not yet complete. The boy still had to find a definite and practical way to convert his disability into an equivalent asset. Hardly realizing the significance of what had already been accomplished, but intoxicated with the joy of his newly discovered world of sound, he wrote a letter to the manufacturer of the hearing aid, enthusiastically describing his experience. Something in his letter, something, perhaps, which was not written on the lines, but back of them, caused the company to invite him to New York. When he arrived, he was escorted through the factory, and while talking with the chief engineer, telling him about his changed world, a hunch, an idea, or an inspiration, call it what you wish, flashed into his mind. It was this impulse of thought which converted his affliction into an asset destined to pay dividends in both money and happiness to thousands of other people. The sum and substance of that impulse of thought was this, it occurred to him that he might be of help to the millions of deaf people who go through life without the benefit of hearing aids, if he could find a way to tell them the story of his changed world. Then and there he reached a decision to devote the remainder of his life to rendering useful service to the heart of hearing. For an entire month he did intensive research during which he analyzed the entire marketing system of the manufacturer of the hearing device. He figured out possible ways and means to communicate with hearing impaired people all over the world for the purpose of sharing with them his newly discovered changed world. When this was done, he put in writing a two-year plan based upon his findings. When he presented the plan to the company, he was instantly given a position for the purpose of carrying out his ambition. Little did he dream when he went to work that he was destined to bring hope and practical relief to thousands of people who without his help would never have overcome their hearing disability. Shortly after he became associated with the manufacturer of his hearing aid, he invited me to attend a class conducted by his company to teach deaf people to hear and to speak. I had never heard of such a form of education, therefore, I visited the class, skeptical but hopeful that my time would not be entirely wasted. Here I saw a demonstration which gave me a greatly enlarged vision of what I had done to arouse and keep alive in my son's mind the desire for normal hearing. I saw deaf people actually being taught to hear 
and to speak through application of the self-same principle I had used more than 20 years previously with my son, Blair. There is no doubt in my mind that Blair would have been unable to hear or speak for all his life if his mother and I had not managed to shape his mind as we did. The doctor who attended at his birth told us the child might never hear a sound or say a word. Later, Dr. Irving Voorhees, a noted specialist on such cases, examined Blair thoroughly. He was astounded when he learned how well my son could hear and speak, and he said his examination indicated that theoretically, the boy should not be able to hear at all. When I planted in Blair's mind the desire to hear and talk and live normally, there went with that impulse some strange influence which caused nature to become bridge builder and to span the gulf of silence between his brain and the outer world by some means which the keenest medical specialists were not able to interpret. It would be sacrilege for me even to pretend I fully understand how nature performed this miracle. It would be unforgivable if I neglected to tell the world as much as I know of the humble part I assumed in the strange experience. It is my duty and a privilege to say I believe, and not without reason, that nothing is impossible to the person who backs desire with enduring faith. A burning desire has devious ways of transmuting itself into its physical equivalent. Blair desired normal hearing. And he received it. He was born with a disability which might easily have sent one with a less defined desire to the street with a bundle of pencils and a tin cup. That disability served as the medium by which he would go on to render useful service to many thousands of hearing impaired people, and it gave him useful employment at adequate financial compensation for years. The little white lie I planted in his mind when he was a child by leading him to believe his affliction would become a great asset which he could capitalize on justified itself. Verily, there is nothing, right or wrong, that belief plus burning desire cannot make real. These qualities are free to everyone. In all my experience in dealing with men and women with personal problems, I never handled a single case which more definitely demonstrated the power of desire. Authors sometimes make the mistake of writing of subjects of which they have, but superficial or very elementary knowledge. It has been my good fortune to have had the privilege of testing the soundness of the power of desire through the affliction of my own son. Perhaps it was providential that the experience came as it did, for surely no one was better prepared than he to serve as an example of what happens when desire is put to the test. If Mother Nature bends to the will of a burning desire, is it logical to think that mere human beings can defeat one? Strange and imponderable is the power of the human mind. We do not understand the method by which it uses every circumstance, every individual, every physical thing within its reach as a means of transmuting desire into its physical counterpart. Perhaps science will one day uncover the secret. I planted in my son's mind the desire to hear and to speak as any other person hears and speaks. That desire became a reality. I planted in his mind the desire to convert his greatest disability into his greatest asset. That desire was realized. The method by which this astounding result was achieved is not hard to describe. It consisted of three very definite acts. First, I mixed faith with a desire for normal hearing, which I passed on to my son. Second, I communicated my desire to him in every conceivable way available through persistent, continuous effort over a period of years. Third, he believed me. As this chapter was being completed, News came of the death of me. Schumann Heink. 16 One short paragraph in the news dispatch about her death gives the clue to this unusual woman's stupendous success as a singer. I quote portions of the paragraph because the clue it contains is none other than desire. Early in her career, me. Schumann Heink visited the director of the Vienna Court Opera to audition for him. But he did not grant the audition. After taking one look at the awkward and poorly dressed girl, he exclaimed, none too gently, with such a face, and with no personality at all, how can you ever expect to succeed in opera? My good child, give up the idea. Buy a sewing machine, and go to work. You can never be a singer. Never is a long time. The director of the Vienna Court Opera knew much about the technique of singing. He knew little about the power of desire, when it assumes the proportion of an obsession. If he had known more about that power, he would not have made the mistake of condemning genius without giving it an opportunity. Several years ago, one of my business associates became seriously ill. 
he became worse as time went on and finally was taken to the hospital for surgery. Just before he was wheeled into the operating room, I took a look at him and wondered how anyone as thin and emaciated as he could possibly go through such a major operation successfully. The surgeon warned me that there was little if any chance of my ever seeing him alive again. But that was the doctor's opinion. It was not the opinion of the patient. Just before he was wheeled away, he whispered feebly, do not be disturbed, chief, I will be out of here in a few days. The attending nurse looked at me with pity. But the patient did come through safely. After it was all over, his physician said, nothing but his own desire to live saved him. He never would have pulled through if he had not refused to accept the possibility of death. I believe in the power of desire backed by faith, because I have seen this power lift people from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which individuals staged a comeback after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life despite nature's having sent him into the world severely disabled. How can one harness and use the power of desire? This question is answered through this and the subsequent chapters of this book. This message is going out to the world at the end of one of the most devastating economic upheavals America has ever known. It is reasonable to presume that the message may come to the attention of many who have been wounded by personal economic calamity, those who have lost their fortunes, others who have lost their positions, and great numbers who must reorganize their plans and stage a comeback. To all these, I wish to convey this thought, all achievement, no matter what may be its nature or its purpose, must begin with an intense, burning desire for something definite. Through some strange and powerful principle of mental chemistry which she has never divulged, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire, that's something which recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality as failure. Fortunately, nature has also given us the way to channel desire unwaveringly toward the goals we name and seek. It is the way of faith, the second step to riches. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced by autosuggestion. Chapter 2. Faith. Visualization and belief in the attainment of desire. The second step to riches. Faith is the head chemist of the mind. When faith is blended with the vibration of thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and transmits it to infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. The emotions of faith, love, and sex are the most powerful of all the major positive emotions. When the three are blended, they have the effect of coloring the vibration of thought in such a way that it instantly reaches the subconscious mind, where it is changed into its spiritual equivalent, the only form that induces a response from infinite intelligence. Love and faith are psychic, related to the spiritual side of humanity. Sex is purely biological and related only to the physical. The mixing or blending of these three emotions has the effect of opening a direct line of communication between the finite, thinking human mind and infinite intelligence. How to develop faith. There comes now a statement which will give a better understanding of the importance the principle of autosuggestion assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical, or monetary, equivalent. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced, or created, by affirmations or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind, through the principle of autosuggestion. As an illustration, consider one main purpose for which, presumably, you are reading this book. The object is, naturally, to acquire the ability to transmute the intangible thought impulse of desire into its physical counterpart, money. By following the instructions laid down in the chapters on autosuggestion, chapter 3, and the subconscious mind, chapter 11, as summarized in the chapter on autosuggestion, you can convince your subconscious mind that you believe you will receive that for which you ask. Your subconscious mind will act upon that belief, then pass it back to you in the form of faith, followed by definite plans for procuring that which you desire. The method by which one develops faith, where it does not already exist, is extremely difficult to describe, almost as difficult, in fact, as it would be, to describe the color of red to a blind person who has never seen color and has nothing with which to compare what you describe. 
Faith is a state of mind which you can develop at will after you have mastered the 13 principles in this book, because it is a state of mind which develops through voluntary application and use of these principles. Repetition or affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. Perhaps the meaning will be made clearer through the following explanation of how individuals sometimes become criminals. Stated in the words of a famous criminologist, when people first come into contact with crime, they abhor it. If they remain in contact with crime for a time, they become accustomed to it and endure it. If they remain in contact with it long enough, they finally embrace it and become influenced by it. This is the equivalent of saying, that any impulse of thought which is repeatedly passed on to the subconscious mind is finally accepted and acted upon by the subconscious mind, which proceeds to translate that impulse into its physical equivalent by the most practical procedure available. In connection with this, consider again the statement all thoughts which have been emotionalized, given feeling, and mixed with faith, begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent or counterpart. The emotions, or the feeling portion of thoughts, are the factors which give thoughts vitality, life, and action. The emotions of faith, love, and sex, when mixed together with any thought impulse, give it greater action than any of these emotions can do singly. It is not only those thought impulses which have been mixed with faith, but those which have been mixed with any of the positive emotions, or any of the negative emotions, that can reach and influence the subconscious mind. From this statement you will understand that the subconscious mind will translate into its physical equivalent a thought impulse of a negative or destructive nature just as readily as it will act upon thought impulses of a positive or constructive nature. This accounts for the strange phenomenon which so many millions of people experience, referred to as misfortune or bad luck. There are millions of people who believe themselves doomed to poverty and failure because of some strange force over which they believe they have no control. They are the creators of their own misfortunes because of this negative belief, which is picked up by their subconscious mind and translated into its physical equivalent. This is an appropriate place at which to suggest again that you may benefit by passing on to your subconscious mind any desire which you wish translated into its physical or monetary equivalent in a state of expectancy or belief that the transmutation will actually take place. Your belief, or faith, is the element which determines the action of your subconscious mind. There is nothing to hinder you from deceiving your subconscious mind when giving it instructions through autosuggestion, as I deceived my son's subconscious mind. To make this deceit more realistic, conduct yourself when you call upon your subconscious mind just as you would if you were already in possession of the material thing which you are demanding. The subconscious mind will transmute into its physical equivalent by the most direct and practical media available. Any order which is given to it in a state of belief or faith that the order will be carried out. Surely, enough has been stated by now to give you a starting point from which you may, through experiment and practice, acquire the ability to mix faith with any order given to your subconscious mind. Perfection will come through practice. It cannot come by merely reading instructions. If it be true that one may become a criminal by association with crime, and this is a known fact, it is equally true that one may develop faith by voluntarily suggesting to the subconscious mind that one has faith. The mind comes, finally, to take on the nature of the influences which dominate it. Understand this truth, and you will know why it is essential for you to encourage the positive emotions as dominating forces of your mind and to discourage and eliminate negative emotions. A mind dominated by positive emotions or positive mental attitude becomes a favorable abode for the state of mind known as faith. A mind so dominated may, at will, give the subconscious mind instructions which it will accept and act upon immediately. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced by autosuggestion. All down the ages, the religionists have admonished struggling humanity to have faith in this, that, and the other dogma or creed but they have failed to tell people how to have faith. They have not stated that faith is a state of mind and that it may be induced by self-suggestion. In language which any normal human being can understand, this book will describe all that is known about the principle through which faith can be developed where it does not already exist. Have faith in yourself.
faith in the infinite. Before we begin, you should be reminded again that faith is the eternal elixir which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. The foregoing sentence is worth reading a second time, and a third, and a fourth. It is worth reading aloud. Faith is the starting point of all accumulation of riches. Faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. Faith is the only known antidote for failure. Faith is the element, the chemical which when mixed with prayer, gives one direct communication with infinite intelligence. Faith is the element which transforms the ordinary vibration of thought, created by the finite human mind, into its spiritual equivalent. Faith is the only agency through which the cosmic force of infinite intelligence can be harnessed and used by humanity. Every one of the foregoing statements is capable of proof. The proof is simple and easily demonstrated. It is wrapped up in the principle of autosuggestion. Let us center our attention, therefore, on the subject of self-suggestion and find out what it is and what it is capable of achieving. It is a well-known fact that one comes finally to believe whatever one repeats to oneself, whether the statement be true or false. If we repeat a lie over and over, we will eventually accept the lie as truth. Moreover, we will believe it to be the truth. Each of us is what we are because of the dominating thoughts which we permit to occupy our mind. Thoughts which we deliberately place in our own mind and encourage with sympathy and with which we mix any one or more of the emotions constitute the motivating forces which direct and control our every movement, act, and deed. Comes, now, a very significant statement of truth. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of emotions constitute a magnetic force which attracts other similar or related thoughts. A thought thus magnetized with emotion may be compared to a seed which, when planted in fertile soil, germinates, grows, and multiplies itself over and over again until that which was originally one small seed becomes countless millions of seeds of the same kind. All human experience and all human thinking occurs in an environment in a universe, saturated with radiated energy and signals. From gravity to magnetism, from cosmic rays to X-rays, infrared rays, visible light, sound waves, radar, short waves, radio and television signals, we live in a world constantly bombarded by vibrations of energy, though we can perceive directly only the tiniest portion of them. Likewise, thought impulses are vibrations of energy transmitted in some deeply mysterious, and as yet uncomprehended, way as electrical and chemical currents among brain cells. While we do not yet understand and cannot describe scientifically the how of the process, it is clear that thought impulses, like electromagnetic radiation, also are out there somehow, as some experiments with extrasensory perception, or Spanish pesetas, seem clearly to indicate. Human experience, like the cosmos itself, teams with thought vibrations or influences, both destructive and constructive. It is characterized, at all times, by vibrations of fear, poverty, disease, failure, misery, and vibrations of prosperity, health, success, and happiness, just as surely as the atmosphere carries the sound of hundreds of orchestrations of music and hundreds of human voices, all of which maintain their own individuality and means of identification through the medium of television or radio. From this great storehouse of experience, the human mind is constantly attracting vibrations which harmonize with that which dominates the mind. Any thought, idea, plan, or purpose which one holds in one's mind attracts from the thought vibrations of existence a host of its relatives, adds these relatives to its own force, and grows until it becomes the dominating, motivating master of the individual in whose mind it has been housed. Now, let us go back to the starting point and become informed as to how the original seed of an idea, plan, or purpose may be planted in the mind. The information is easily conveyed, any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. This is why you are asked in the next few pages to write out a statement of your major purpose or definite chief aim, committed to memory, and repeat it out loud day after day until these vibrations of sound have reached your subconscious mind. We are what we are because of the vibrations of thought which we pick up and register through the stimuli of our daily environment. 
resolve to throw off the influences of any unfortunate environment you may have grown up in, or now find yourself living in, and to build your own life to order. Taking inventory of mental assets and abilities, you will discover that your greatest weakness is lack of self-confidence. This handicap can be surmounted, and timidity translated into courage, through the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion. The application of this principle may be made through a simple arrangement of positive thought impulses stated in writing, memorized, and repeated until they become a part of the working equipment of your subconscious mind. Self-confidence formula. First, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life, therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment, and I hear, and now promise to render such action. Second, I realize that the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward, physical action, and gradually transform themselves into physical reality, therefore, I will concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating in my mind a clear mental picture of that person. Third, I know that through the principle of auto-suggestion any desire, that I persistently hold in my mind will eventually seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it, therefore, I will devote 10 minutes daily to demanding of myself a development of self-confidence. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite chief aim in life, and I will never stop trying until I shall have developed sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. Four fifth, I fully realize that no wealth or position can long endure, unless built upon truth and justice, therefore, I will engage in no transaction that does not benefit all whom it affects. I will succeed by attracting to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people. I will induce others to serve me because of my willingness to serve others. I will eliminate hatred, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for all humanity because I know that a negative attitude toward others can never bring me success. I will cause others to believe in me because I will believe in them and in myself. Sixth, I will sign my name to this formula, commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions, so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. Back of this formula, is a law of nature which no one has yet been able to explain. It has baffled the scientists of all ages. The psychologists have named this the law of auto-suggestion, and let it go at that. The name by which one calls this law is of little importance. The important fact about it is, it works for the glory and success of mankind, if it is used constructively. On the other hand, if used destructively, it will destroy just as readily. In this statement, may be found a very significant truth, namely, that those who go down in defeat, and end their lives in poverty, misery, and distress do so, because of negative application of the principle of autosuggestion. The cause may be found in the fact, that all impulses of thought have a tendency, to clothe themselves in their physical equivalent. The subconscious mind, the chemical laboratory in which all thought impulses are combined and made ready for translation into physical reality, makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into reality a thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. The pages of medical history, are rich with illustrations of cases of suggestive suicide. A person may commit suicide through negative suggestion just as effectively as by any other means. In a Midwestern city, a man by the name of Joseph Grant, a bank official, borrowed a large sum of the bank's money without the consent of the directors. He lost the money through gambling. One afternoon, the bank examiner came and began to check the accounts. Grant left the bank, took a room in a local hotel, and when they found him three days later, he was lying in bed, wailing and moaning, repeating over and over these words, my God, this will kill me. I cannot stand the disgrace. In a short time he was dead. The doctors pronounced the case one of mental suicide. Just as electricity turns the wheels of industry and renders useful service if used constructively or can snuff out life if used improperly, so will the law of autosuggestion lead you to 
peace and prosperity or down into the valley of misery, failure, and death, according to your degree of understanding and application of it. If you fill your mind with fear, doubt, and unbelief in your ability to connect with and use the forces of infinite intelligence, then the law of autosuggestion will take this spirit of unbelief and use it as a pattern by which your subconscious mind will translate it into its physical equivalent. This statement is as true as the statement that 2 and 2 equals 4. Like the wind which carries one ship east and another west, the law of autosuggestion will lift you up or pull you down, according to the way you set your sails of thought. The law of autosuggestion, through which any person may rise to altitudes of achievement which stagger the imagination, is well described in the following verse. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it is almost certain you won't. If you think you lose, you're lost, for out of the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are, you've got to think high to rise, you've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or late the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Observe the words which have been emphasized, and you will catch the deep meaning the poet had in mind. Somewhere in your makeup, perhaps in the cells of your brain, there lies sleeping the seed of achievement which, if aroused and put into action, would carry you to heights such as you may never have hoped to attain. Just as a master musician may cause the most beautiful strains of music to pour forth from the strings of a violin, so may you arouse the genius which lies asleep in your brain and cause it to drive you upward to whatever goal you may wish to achieve. Abraham Lincoln was a failure at everything he tried until he was well past the age of 40. He was a mister. Nobody from nowhere until a great experience came into his life, aroused the sleeping genius within his heart and brain, and gave the world one of its truly great men. That experience was mixed with the emotions of sorrow and love. It came to him through Anne Rutledge, the only woman he ever truly loved. It is a known fact that the emotion of love is closely akin to the state of mind known as faith, because love comes very near to translating one's thought impulses into their spiritual equivalent. During my long years of research, I discovered from the analysis of the life work and achievements of hundreds of people of outstanding accomplishment that there was the influence of a spouse's love back of nearly every one of them. If you wish evidence of the power of faith, study the achievements of men and women who have employed it. At the head of the list comes the Nazarene. Christianity is one of the greatest single forces ever to influence the minds of people. The basis of Christianity is faith, no matter how many people may have perverted or misinterpreted the meaning of this great force, and no matter how many dogmas and creeds have been created in its name which do not reflect its tenets. The sum and substance of the teachings and the achievements of Christ, which have been interpreted as miracles, were nothing more nor less than faith. If there are any such phenomena as miracles, they are produced only through the state of mind known as faith. Some teachers of religion and many who call themselves Christians neither understand nor practice faith. Faith is the cornerstone of every great religion. The Old Testament psalmist has written, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful, and plentifully rewarded the proud doer. The Apostle Luke tells us, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people, and Mark reports Jesus as saying, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. The prophet says in the Quran, Surely those who believe and do good, their Lord will guide them by their faith, there shall flow from beneath them rivers and gardens of bliss. In the Analects of Confucius, the Master says, Hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principles, and be moving continually to what is right. This is the way to exalt one's virtue. In the Bhagavad Gita we find, the faith of each is in accordance with one's own nature. A person is known by the faith. One can become whatever one wants to be, if one constantly contemplates on the object of desire with faith. And again, the one who has faith and is sincere and has mastery over the senses, gains knowledge. Having gained this, one at once attains the supreme peace. But the ignorant, who has no faith and is full of doubt perishes. There is neither this world nor the world beyond, nor happiness for the one who doubts. 
Let us consider the power of faith as it was demonstrated by Mahatma Gandhi of India, who exhorted his followers to be the change you want to see in the world. In this man the world had one of the most astounding examples known to civilization of the possibilities of faith. Gandhi wielded more power than any other person living in his time, and, yet, he had none of the orthodox tools of power such as money, battleships, soldiers, and materials of warfare. Gandhi had no money, he had no home, he did not own a suit of clothes, but he did have power. How did he come by that power? He created it out of his understanding of the principle of faith, and through his ability to transplant that faith into the minds of 200 million people. Gandhi accomplished through the influence of faith, that which the strongest military power on earth could not then, and never will, accomplish through soldiers and military equipment. He accomplished the astounding feat of influencing 200 million minds to coalesce and move in unison, as a single mind. What other force on earth except faith, could do as much? There will come a day when employees, as well as employers, will discover the possibilities of faith. That day is dawning. The whole world has had ample opportunity during the recent worldwide economic downturn to witness what the lack of faith will do to business. Surely, civilization has produced a sufficient number of intelligent human beings to make use of this great lesson which has been taught the world. During this time of difficulty, the world had evidence in abundance that widespread fear can paralyze the wheels of industry and business. Out of this experience, will arise leaders in business and industry who will profit by the example which Gandhi set for the world, and they will apply to business the same tactics which he used in building the greatest following known in the history of the world. These leaders will come from the rank and file of the unknown who now labor in the steel plants, the coal mines, the factories, and in the small towns and cities of America. Business is due for a reform, make no mistake about this. The methods of the past, based upon economic combinations of force and fear, will be supplanted by the better principles. The faith and cooperation. People who labor will receive more than daily wages. They will share more and more in profits from the business, the same as those who supply the capital for business. But first they must give more to their employers and stop bickering and bargaining by force, at the expense of the public. They must earn the right to profit sharing. Moreover, and this is the most important thing of all, they will be led by leaders who will understand and apply the principles employed by Gandhi. Only in this way, can leaders get from their followers the spirit of full cooperation which constitutes power in its highest and most enduring form. This stupendous age in which we live and from which we are just emerging has taken the soul out of people. Its leaders have driven workers as though they were pieces of cold machinery, they were forced to do so by the employees who bargained, at the expense of all concerned, to get and not to give. The watchword of the future will be human happiness and contentment, and when this state of mind shall have been attained, the production will take care of itself more effectively than anything that has ever been accomplished where workers did not, and could not, mix faith and individual interest with their labor. Because of the need for faith and cooperation in operating business and industry, it is both interesting and profitable to analyze an event which provides an excellent understanding of the method by which industrialists and business people accumulate great fortunes by giving before they try to get. The event chosen for this illustration dates back to 1900, when the United States Steel Corporation was being formed. As you read the story, keep in mind these fundamental facts, and you will understand how ideas have been converted into huge fortunes. First, the huge United States Steel Corporation was born in the mind of Charles M. Schwab in the form of an idea he created through his imagination. Second, he mixed faith with his idea. Third, he formulated a plan for the transformation of his idea into physical and financial reality. Fourth, he put his plan into action with his famous speech at the university club. Fifth, he applied and followed through on his plan with persistence and backed it with firm decision until it had been fully carried out. Sixth, he prepared the way for success by a burning desire for success. If you are one of those who often wonder how great fortunes are accumulated, this story of the creation of the United States Steel Corporation will be enlightening. If you have any doubt that individuals can think and grow rich, this story should dispel that doubt.
because you can plainly see in the story of U.S. Steel the application of a major portion of the 13 steps to riches described in this book. This astounding description of the power of an idea was dramatically told by John Lowell in the New York World Telegram, with whose courtesy it is here reprinted. A pretty after-dinner speech. For a billion dollars. When, on the evening of December 12, 1900, some 80 of the nation's financial nobility gathered in the banquet hall of the University Club on Fifth Avenue to do honor to a young man from out of the West, not half a dozen of the guests realized they were to witness the most significant episode in American industrial history. J. Edward Simmons and Charles Stuart Smith, their hearts full of gratitude for the lavish hospitality bestowed on them by Charles M. Schwab during a recent visit to Pittsburgh, had arranged a dinner to introduce the 38-year-old steel man to Eastern Banking Society. But they didn't expect him to stampede the convention. They warned him, in fact, that the bosoms within New York stuffed shirts would not be responsive to oratory, and that, if he didn't want to bore the Stillmans and Harrimans and Vanderbilts, he had better limit himself to 15 or 20 minutes of polite vaporings and let it go at that. Even John Pierpont Morgan, sitting on the right hand of Schwab as became his imperial dignity, intended to grace the banquet table with his presence only briefly. And so far as the press and public were concerned, the whole affair was of so little moment that no mention of it found its way into print the next day. So the two hosts and their distinguished guests ate their way through the usual seven or eight courses. There was little conversation, and what there was of it was restrained. Few of the bankers and brokers had met Schwab, whose career had flowered along the banks of the Monongahela, and none knew him well. But before the evening was over, they and with a money master Morgan were to be swept off their feet, and a billion-dollar baby, the United States Steel Corporation, was to be conceived. It is perhaps unfortunate, for the sake of history, that no record of Charlie Schwab's speech at the dinner ever was made. He repeated some parts of it at a later date during a similar meeting of Chicago bankers. And still later, when the government brought suit to dissolve the Steel Trust, he gave his own version, from the witness stand, of the remarks that stimulated Morgan into a frenzy of financial activity. It is probable, however, that it was a homely speech, somewhat ungrammatical, for the niceties of language never bothered Schwab, full of epigram and threaded with wit. But aside from, that it had a galvanic force and effect upon the five billions of estimated capital that was represented by the diners. After it was over and the gathering was still under its spell, although Schwab had talked for 90 minutes, Morgan led the orator to a recessed window where, dangling their legs from the high, uncomfortable seat, they talked for an hour more. The magic of the Schwab personality had been turned on, full force, but what was more important and lasting was the full-fledged, clear-cut program he laid down for the aggrandizement of steel. Many other men had tried to interest Morgan in slapping together a steel trust after the pattern of the biscuit, wire and hoop, sugar, rubber, whiskey, oil, or chewing gum combinations. John W. Gates, the gambler, had urged it, but Morgan distrusted him. The Moore boys, Bill and Jim, Chicago stock jobbers who had glued together a match trust and a cracker corporation, had urged it and failed. Albert H. Gary, the sanctimonious country lawyer, wanted to foster it, but he wasn't big enough to be impressive. Until Schwab's eloquence took J.P. Morgan to the heights from which he could visualize the solid results of the most daring financial undertaking ever conceived, the project was regarded as a delirious dream of easy money crackpots. The financial magnetism that began a generation ago to attract thousands of small and sometimes inefficiently managed companies into large and competition-crushing combinations had become operative in the steel world through the devices of that jovial business pirate, John W. Gates. Gates already had formed the American Steel and Wire Company out of a chain of small concerns and together with Morgan, had created the Federal Steel Company. The National Tube and American Bridge Companies were two more Morgan concerns, and the Moore brothers had forsaken the match and cookie business to form the American Group, Tin Plate, Steel Hoop, Sheet Steel, and the National Steel Company. But by the side of Andrew Carnegie's gigantic vertical trust, a trust owned and operated by 53 partners, those other combinations were picking. 
they might combine to their heart's content, but the whole lot of them couldn't make a dent in the Carnegie organization, and Morgan knew it. The eccentric old Scott knew it, too. From the magnificent heights of Skybo Castle he had viewed, first with amusement and then with resentment, the attempts of Morgan's smaller companies to cut into his business. When the attempts became too bold, Carnegie's temper was translated into anger and retaliation. He decided to duplicate every mill owned by his rivals. Hitherto, he hadn't been interested in wire, pipe, hoops, or sheet. Instead, he was content to sell such companies the raw steel and let them work it into whatever shape they wanted. Now, with Schwab as his chief and able lieutenant, he planned to drive his enemies to the wall. So it was that in the speech of Charles M. Schwab, Morgan saw the answer to his problem of combination. A trust without Carnegie, giant of them all, would be no trust at all, a plum pudding, as one writer said, without the plums. Skybo was a splendid castle Carnegie built for his family on Dornich Firth in Scotland. Schwab's speech on the night of December 12, 1900, undoubtedly carried the inference, though not the pledge, that the vast Carnegie enterprise could be brought under the Morgan tent. He talked of the world future for steel, of reorganization for efficiency, of specialization, of the scrapping of unsuccessful mills, and concentration of effort on the flourishing properties, of economies in the ore traffic, of economies in overhead and administrative departments, of capturing foreign markets. More than that, he told the buccaneers among them wherein lay the errors of their customary piracy. Their purposes, he inferred, had been to create monopolies, raise prices, and pay themselves fat dividends out of privilege. Schwab condemned the system in his heartiest manner. The short-sightedness of such a policy, he told his hearers, lay in the fact that it restricted the market in an era when everything cried for expansion. By cheapening the cost of steel, he argued, an ever-expanding market would be created, more uses for steel would be devised, and a goodly portion of the world trade could be captured. Actually, though he did not know it, Schwab was an apostle of modern mass production. So the dinner at the university club came to an end. Morgan went home to think about Schwab's rosy predictions. Schwab went back to Pittsburgh to run the steel business for Weandra Carnegie, while Gary and the rest went back to their stock tickers to fiddle around in anticipation of the next move. It was not long coming. It took Morgan about one week to digest the feast of reason Schwab had placed before him. When he had assured himself that no financial indigestion was to result, he sent for Schwab and found that young man rather coy. Mr. Carnegie, Schwab indicated, might not like it, if he found his trusted company president had been flirting with the Emperor of Wall Street, the street upon which Carnegie was resolved never to tread. The truth is exactly the opposite. When Schwab was called in to consummate the deal, he didn't even know whether the little boss, as Andrew was called, would so much as listen to an offer to sell, particularly to a group of men whom Andrew regarded as being endowed with something less than holiness. But Schwab did take into the conference with him, in his own handwriting, six sheets of copper plate figures, representing to his mind the physical worth and the potential earning capacity of every steel company he regarded as an essential star in the new metal firmament. Four men pondered over these figures all night. The chief, of course, was Morgan, steadfast in his belief in the divine right of money. With him was his aristocratic partner, Robert Bacon, a scholar and a gentleman. The third was John W. Gates, whom Morgan scorned as a gambler and used as a tool. The fourth was Schwab, who knew more about the processes of making and selling steel than any whole group of men then living. Throughout that conference, the Pittsburghers' figures were never questioned. If he said a company was worth so much, then it was worth that much and no more. He was insistent too, upon including in the combination only those concerns he nominated. He had conceived a corporation in which there would be no duplication, not even to satisfy the greed of friends who wanted to unload their companies upon the broad Morgan shoulders. Thus he left out, by design, a number of the larger concerns upon which the walruses and carpenters of Wall Street had cast hungry eyes. When dawn came, Morgan rose and straightened his back. Only one question remained. Do you think you can persuade Andrew Carnegie to sell? He asked. I can try, said Schwab. 
If you can get him to sell, I will undertake the matter, said Morgan. So far so good. But would Carnegie sell? How much would he demand? Schwab thought about 320 million. What would he take payment in? Common or preferred stocks? Bonds? Cash? Nobody could raise a third of a billion dollars in cash. There was a golf game in January on the frost-cracking heath of the St. Andrews links in Westchester, with Andrew bundled up in sweaters against the cold, and Charlie talking volubly, as usual, to keep his spirits up. But no word of business was mentioned until the pair sat down in the cozy warmth of the Carnegie Cottage hard by. Then, with the same persuasiveness that had hypnotized 80 millionaires at the university club, Schwab poured out the glittering promises of retirement and comfort, of untold millions to satisfy the old man's social caprices. Carnegie capitulated, wrote a figure on a slip of paper, handed it to Schwab and said, all right, that's what we'll sell for. The figure was approximately 400 million and was reached by taking the 320 million mentioned by Schwab as a basic figure and adding to it 80 million to represent the increased capital value over the previous two years. Later, on the deck of a transatlantic liner, the Scotsman said ruefully to Morgan, I wish I had asked you for 100 million more. If you had asked for it, you'd have gotten it, Morgan told him cheerfully. There was an uproar, of course. A British correspondent cabled that the foreign steel world was appalled by the gigantic combination. President Hadley, of Yale, declared that unless trusts were regulated the country might expect an emperor in Washington within the next 25 years. But that able stock manipulator, Keane, went at his work of shoving the new stock at the public so vigorously that all the excess water, estimated by some at nearly 600 million, was absorbed in a twinkling. So Carnegie had his millions, and the Morgan syndicate had 62 million for all its trouble, and all the boys, from Gates to Gary, had their millions. The 38-year-old Schwab had his reward. He was made president of the new corporation and remained in control until 1930. The dramatic story of big business which you have just finished was included in this book because it is a perfect illustration of the method by which desire can be transmuted into its physical equivalent. I imagine some readers will question the statement that a mere intangible desire can be converted into its physical equivalent. Dallison will say, you cannot convert nothing into something. The answer is in the story of United States Steel. That giant organization was created in the mind of one man. The plan by which the organization was provided with the steel mills that gave it financial stability was created in the mind of the same man. His faith, his desire, his imagination, his persistence were the real ingredients that went into United States Steel. The steel mills and mechanical equipment acquired by the corporation after it had been brought into legal existence were incidental, but careful analysis will disclose the fact that the appraised value of the properties acquired by the corporation increased in value by an estimated $600 million by the mere transaction which consolidated them under one management. In other words, Charles M. Schwab's idea, plus the faith with which he conveyed it to the minds of J.P. Morgan and the others, was marketed for a profit of approximately $600 million. Not an insignificant sum for a single idea, what happened to some of those who took their share of the millions of dollars of profit made by this transaction is a matter with which we are not now concerned. The important feature of the astounding achievement is that it serves as unquestionable evidence of the soundness of the philosophy described in this book, because this philosophy was the warp and the woof of the entire transaction. Moreover, the practicability of the philosophy has been established by the fact that the United States Steel Corporation prospered and became one of the richest and most powerful corporations in America, employing thousands of people, developing new uses for steel, and opening new markets, thus proving that the $600 million in profit which the Schwab idea produced was earned. Riches begin in the form of thought. The amount is limited only by the person in whose mind the thought is put into motion. Faith removes limitations. Remember this when you are ready to bargain with life for whatever it is that you ask as your price for having passed this way. Remember, also, that the man who created the United States Steel Corporation was practically unknown at the time. He was merely Andrew Carnegie's man Friday until he gave birth to his famous idea. 
after that he quickly rose to a position of power, fame, and riches. And he rose, like all great achievers, on the wings of faith, which can be created by a powerful force known as auto-suggestion. Chapter 3. Auto-suggestion. The medium for influencing the subconscious mind. The third step to riches. Auto-suggestion is a term which applies to all suggestions and all self-administered stimuli which reach one's mind through the five senses. Stated in another way, auto-suggestion is self-suggestion. It is the agency of communication between that part of the mind, where conscious thought takes place and that which serves as the seat of action for the subconscious mind. The dominating thoughts which one permits to remain in the conscious mind, whether these thoughts be negative or positive is immaterial, will reach and influence the subconscious mind through the law of auto-suggestion. No thought, whether it be negative or positive, can enter the subconscious mind without the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion, with the exception of those thoughts picked up as flashes of insight or inspiration. Stated differently, all sense impressions which are perceived through the five senses are captured and processed by the conscious thinking mind and may be either passed on to the subconscious mind or rejected at will. The conscious faculty serves, therefore, as an outer guard of the approach to the subconscious. Nature has so wired human beings that they have absolute control over the material which reaches their subconscious mind through the five senses, although this is not meant to be construed as a statement that individuals always exercise this control. In the great majority of instances, they do not exercise it, which explains why so many people go through life in poverty. Recall what has been said about the subconscious mind resembling a fertile garden in which weeds will grow in abundance if the seeds of more desirable crops are not sown therein. Autosuggestion is the agency of control through which an individual may voluntarily feed his or her subconscious mind on thoughts of a creative nature or, by neglect, permit thoughts of a destructive nature to find their way into this rich garden of the mind. You were instructed in the last of the six action steps described in Chapter 1 to read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money and to see and feel yourself already in possession of the money. By following these instructions, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind in a spirit of absolute faith. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. This procedure is not restricted to monetary gain alone. It can be used to help you achieve whatever it is that you desire strongly, so long as it does not violate the laws of God or the rights of others. Go back to these six actions described in Chapter 1 and read them again very carefully before you proceed further. Then skip ahead for a moment and read very carefully the four instructions for the organization of your mastermind group which are described in Chapter 6 on Organized Planning. By comparing these two sets of instructions with those that will be stated in this chapter on autosuggestion, you will see that all of these instructions involve the application of the law of autosuggestion. Remember, therefore, when reading aloud the statement of your desire, through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness or any other success consciousness, that the mere reading of the words is of no consequence unless you mix emotion or feeling with your words. If you repeat a million times the famous Emil Cow formula, day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better, without mixing emotion and faith with your words, you will experience no desirable results. Your subconscious mind recognizes and acts only upon thoughts which have been well mixed with emotion or feeling. This is a fact of such importance as to warrant repetition in practically every chapter of this book, because the lack of understanding of this truth is the main reason why the majority of people who try to apply the law of autosuggestion get no desirable results. Plain, unemotional words do not influence the subconscious mind. You will get no appreciable results until you learn to reach your subconscious mind with thoughts or spoken words, which have been well emotionalized with belief. Do not become discouraged if you cannot control and direct your emotions the first time you try to do so. Remember, there is no such possibility as something for nothing. The ability to reach and influence your subconscious mind has its price, and you must pay that price. You cannot cheat, even if you desire to do so. The price of ability 
to influence your subconscious mind is everlasting persistence in applying the principles described here. You cannot develop the desired ability for a lower price. You, and you alone, must decide whether or not the reward for which you are striving, money consciousness, is worth the price you must pay for it in effort. Wisdom and cleverness alone will not attract and retain money except in a few very rare instances where the law of averages favors the attraction of money through such means. However, the method of attracting money described here does not depend upon the law of averages. Moreover, the method plays no favorites. It will work for one person as effectively as it will for another. Where failure is experienced, it is the individual, not the method, which has failed. If you try and fail, make another effort, and still another, until you succeed. Your ability to use the law of autosuggestion will depend very largely upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire, until that desire becomes a burning obsession. When you begin to carry out the instructions in connection with the six action steps described in Chapter 1, it will be necessary for you to make use of the principle of concentration. Let us here offer suggestions for the effective use of concentration. When you begin to carry out the first of the six actions, which instructs you to fix in your own mind the exact amount of money you desire, hold your thoughts on that amount of money by concentration or fixation of attention with your eyes closed until you can actually see the physical appearance of the money. Do this at least once each day. As you go through these exercises, follow the instructions given in Chapter 2 on faith and see yourself actually in possession of the money. Here is a most significant fact. The subconscious mind takes any orders given it in a spirit of absolute faith and acts upon those orders, although the orders often have to be presented over and over again, through repetition, before they are interpreted by the subconscious mind. Consider the possibility of playing a perfectly legitimate trick on your subconscious mind by making it believe, because you believe it, that you must have the amount of money you are visualizing, that this money is already awaiting your claim that the subconscious mind must hand over to you practical plans for acquiring the money which is yours. Hand over the thoughts suggested in the preceding paragraph to your imagination and see what your imagination can, or will do, to create practical plans for the accumulation of money through transmutation of your desire. Do not wait for a definite plan through which you intend to exchange services or merchandise in return for the money you are visualizing, but begin at once to see yourself in possession of the money, demanding and expecting meanwhile that your subconscious mind will hand over the plan or plans you need. Be on the alert for these plans, and when they appear, put them into action immediately. When the plans appear, they will probably flash into your mind through the sixth sense in the form of an inspiration. This inspiration may be considered a direct telegram or message from infinite intelligence. Treat it with respect and act upon it as soon as you receive it. Failure to do this will be fatal to your success. In the fourth of the six action steps you were instructed to create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once to put this plan into action. You should follow this instruction in the manner described in the preceding. Paragraph. Do not trust to your reason when creating your plan for accumulating money through the transmutation of desire. Your reason is faulty. Moreover, your reasoning faculty may be lazy, and if you depend entirely upon it to serve you, it may disappoint you. When visualizing, with closed eyes, the money you intend to accumulate, see yourself rendering the service or delivering the merchandise you intend to give in return for this money. This is important. Summary of Instructions The fact that you are reading this book is an indication that you earnestly seek knowledge. It is also an indication that you are a student of this subject. If you are only a student, there is a chance you may learn much that you did not know, but you will learn only by assuming an attitude of humility. If you choose to follow some of the instructions, but neglect or refuse to follow others you will fail. To get satisfactory results, you must follow all instructions in the spirit of faith. The instructions given in connection with the six action steps in Chapter 1 will now be summarized and blended with the principles covered by this chapter. If your definite chief aim involves money and the attainment of wealth. First. Go into some quiet spot, preferably in bed at night, where you will not be disturbed or interrupted, close your eyes, 
and repeat aloud, so you may hear your own words, the written statement of the amount of money you intend to accumulate, the time limit for its accumulation, and a description of the service or merchandise you intend to give in return for the money. As you carry out these instructions, see yourself already in possession of the money. For example, suppose that you intend to accumulate 500,000 by the 1st of January, five years hence, that you intend to give personal services in return for the money in the capacity of a sales representative. Your written statement of your purpose should be similar to the following, by the first day of January, here stay the year, I will have in my possession 500,000, which will come to me in various amounts from time to time during the interim. In return for this money I will give the most efficient service of which I am capable, rendering the fullest possible quantity and the best possible quality of service in the capacity of selling. Describe the service or merchandise you intend to sell. I believe that I will have this money in my possession. My faith is so strong that I can now see this money before my eyes. I can touch it with my hands. It is now awaiting transfer to me at the time and in the proportion that I deliver the service I intend to render in return for it. I am awaiting a plan by which to accumulate this money and I will follow that plan when it is received. Second, repeat this program night and morning until you can clearly visualize, in your imagination, the money you intend to accumulate. Third, place a written copy of your statement where you can see it night and morning and read it just before retiring and upon arising until it has been memorized. Remember as you carry out these instructions that you are applying the law of autosuggestion for the purpose of giving orders to your subconscious mind. Remember that these instructions apply particularly to the desire for money, but also to any other object you desire or goal you seek. Remember also that your subconscious mind will act only upon instructions which are emotionalized and handed over to it with feeling. Faith is the strongest and most productive of the emotions. Follow the instructions given in Chapter 2. These instructions may at first seem abstract. Do not let this disturb you. Follow the instructions, no matter how abstract or impractical they may at first appear to be. The time will soon come, if you do as you have been instructed, in spirit as well as in fact, when a whole new universe of power will unfold to you. Skepticism, in connection with all new ideas, is characteristic of all human beings. But if you follow the instructions outlined, your skepticism will soon be replaced by belief, and this in turn will soon become crystallized into absolute faith. Then you will have arrived at the point where you may truly say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Many philosophers have made the statement that each person is the master of his or her own earthly destiny, but most of them have failed to say why this is so. The reason that we may be the master of our own earthly status and especially our financial status, is thoroughly explained in this chapter. We may become the master of ourselves and of our environment because we have the power to influence our own subconscious mind and through it to gain the cooperation of infinite intelligence. The chapter you are now reading represents the keystone in the arch of the think and grow rich philosophy. The instructions contained in this chapter must be understood and applied with persistence if you are to succeed in transmuting desire into money or any other result you seek. The actual performance of transmuting desire into money involves the use of autosuggestion as an agency by which you may reach and influence the subconscious mind. The other principles are simply tools with which to apply autosuggestion. Keep this thought in mind and you will at all times be conscious of the important part that the law of autosuggestion is to play in your efforts to accumulate money through the methods described in this book. Carry out these instructions as though you are a small child. Inject into your effort something of the faith of a child. I have been most careful to see that no impractical instructions are included because of my sincere desire to be helpful. After you have read the entire book, come back to this chapter and follow in spirit and in action, this instruction, read this entire chapter aloud once every night until you become thoroughly convinced that the principle of autosuggestion is sound, that it will accomplish for you all that has been claimed for it. As you read, underscore with a pencil every sentence which impresses you favorably. Follow the foregoing instructions to the letter 
and it will open the way for a complete understanding and mastery of all the principles of success, including the one to which we now turn, specialized knowledge, the fourth step to riches. I believe that close association with one who refuses to compromise with circumstances he or she does not like is an asset that can never be measured in terms of money. Chapter 4. Specialized Knowledge. Personal Experiences or Observations. The fourth step to riches. There are two kinds of knowledge. One is general, the other, specialized. General knowledge, no matter how great in quantity or variety it may be, is of but little use in the accumulation of money. The faculties of the great universities possess, in the aggregate, practically every form of general knowledge known to civilization. Most of the professors have not amassed great wealth. They specialize in teaching knowledge, but they do not specialize in the organization or the use of knowledge for the accumulation of money. Knowledge will not attract money or any other kind of success unless it is organized and intelligently directed through practical plans of action to the definite end of accumulating money. Lack of understanding of this fact has been the source of confusion to millions of people who falsely believe that knowledge is power. It is nothing of the sort. Knowledge is only potential power. It becomes power only when, and if, it is organized into definite plans of action and directed to a definite end. This missing link in all systems of education known to civilization today may be found in the failure of educational institutions to teach their students how to organize and use knowledge after they acquire it. Many people make the mistake of assuming that because Henry Ford had but little schooling, he was not educated. Those who make this mistake did not know Henry Ford, nor do they understand the real meaning of the word educate. The word is derived from the Latin word educo, meaning to adduce, to draw out, to develop from within. An educated person is not necessarily one who has an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. To be truly educated is to have so developed the faculties of mind that one may acquire anything one wishes, or its equivalent, without violating the rights of others. Henry Ford comes well within the meaning of this definition. During World War I, a Chicago newspaper published certain editorials in which, among other statements, Henry Ford was called an ignorant pacifist. Mr. Ford objected to the statements and brought suit against the paper for libeling him. When the suit was tried in the courts, the attorneys for the paper pleaded justification and placed Mr. Ford himself on the witness stand for the purpose of proving to the jury that he was ignorant. The attorneys asked Mr. Ford a great variety of questions, all of them intended to prove by his own evidence that, while he might possess considerable specialized knowledge pertaining to the manufacture of automobiles, he was, in the main, ignorant. Mr. Ford was plied with such questions as the following, who was Benedict Arnold, and how many soldiers did the British send over to America to put down the rebellion of 1776? In answer to the last question, Mr. Ford replied, I do not know the exact number of soldiers the British sent over, but I have heard that it was a considerably larger number than ever went back. Finally, Mr. Ford became tired of this line of questioning, and in reply to a particularly offensive question, he leaned over, pointed his finger at the lawyer who had asked the question, and said, if I should really want to answer the foolish question you have just asked, or any of the other questions you have been asking me, let me remind you that I have a row of electric push buttons on my desk, and by pushing the right button, I can summon to my aid men who can answer any question I desire to ask concerning the business to which I am devoting most of my efforts. Now, will you kindly tell me why I should clutter up my mind with general knowledge for the purpose of being able to answer questions when I have men around me who can supply any knowledge I require? There certainly was good logic to that reply. The answer floored the lawyer. Every person in the courtroom realized it was the answer, not of an ignorant man, but of a man of education. Any person is educated who knows where to get knowledge when it is needed, and how to organize that knowledge into definite plans of action. Through the assistance of his mastermind group, Henry Ford had at his command all the specialized knowledge he needed to enable him to become one of the wealthiest individuals in America. It was not essential that he have this knowledge in his own mind. 
surely no person who has sufficient inclination and intelligence to read a book of this nature can possibly miss the significance of this illustration. Before you can be sure of your ability to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent, you will require specialized knowledge of the service, merchandise, or profession which you intend to offer in return for fortune. Perhaps you may need much more specialized knowledge than you have the ability or the inclination to acquire, and if this should be true, you may bridge your weakness through the aid of your mastermind group. Andrew Carnegie stated that he personally knew nothing about the technical end of the steel business. Moreover, he did not particularly care to know anything about it. The specialized knowledge which he required for the manufacture and marketing of steel he found available through the individual units of his mastermind group. The accumulation of great fortunes calls for power, and power is acquired through highly organized and intelligently directed specialized knowledge, but that knowledge does not necessarily have to be in the possession of the person who accumulates the fortune. The preceding paragraph should give hope and encouragement to the person who has ambition to accumulate a fortune, but who does not have the necessary education to supply such specialized knowledge as may be required. People sometimes go through life suffering from inferiority complexes because they are not well educated. Yet, the individual who can organize and direct a mastermind group of people who possess knowledge useful in the accumulation of money is just as educated as anyone in the group. Remember that if you suffer from a feeling of inferiority because your schooling has been limited. Thomas A. Edison had only three months of formal education during his entire life. Yet he did not lack education, nor did he die poor. Henry Ford had less than a sixth grade schooling, but he managed to do pretty well by himself financially. Specialized knowledge is among the most plentiful and the cheapest forms of service which may be had. If you doubt this, consult the peril of any college or university. It pays to know how to purchase knowledge. First of all, decide the sort of specialized knowledge you require and the purpose for which it is needed. To a large extent, your major purpose in life, the goal toward which you are working, will help determine what knowledge you need. With this question settled, your next move requires that you have accurate information concerning dependable sources of knowledge. The more important of these are, a, your own experience and education. b, experience and education available through cooperation of others, mastermind alliance. c, colleges and universities. d, public libraries, through books and periodicals in which may be found all the knowledge organized by civilization. e, special training courses, through night schools and home study materials in particular. As knowledge is acquired, it must be organized and put into use, for a definite purpose, through practical plans. Knowledge has no value except that which can be gained from its application towards some worthy end. This is one reason why a college degree in itself is not valued more highly. It often represents nothing but miscellaneous knowledge. If you contemplate pursuing additional formal education, first determine the purpose for which you want the knowledge you are seeking, then learn where this particular sort of knowledge can be obtained from reliable sources. Successful people, in all callings, never stop acquiring specialized knowledge related to their major purpose, business, or profession. Those who are not successful usually make the mistake of believing that the knowledge acquiring period ends when one finishes school. The truth is that formal education does, but little more than to put one in the way of learning how to acquire practical knowledge. We find ourselves in a changed world today, and we have also seen some astounding changes in educational requirements. The order of the day is specialization. This truth was emphasized by Robert P. Moore, quoted in a piece written when he was an administrator at Columbia University, specialists most sought. Particularly sought after by employing companies are candidates who have specialized in some field business school graduates with training in accounting and statistics, engineers of all varieties, journalists, architects, chemists, and also outstanding leaders of the senior class. The graduate who has been active on the campus, whose personality is such that he or she gets along with all kinds of people, and who has done an adequate job with studies, has a most decided edge over the strictly academic student. Some of these, because of their all-around qualifications, have received several offers of positions, a few of them as many as six. 
in departing from the conception that the straight-A student was invariably the one to get the choice of the better jobs, Mr. Moore said that most companies look not only to academic records, but to activity records and personalities of the students. One of the largest industrial companies, the leader in its field, in writing to Mr. Moore concerning prospective seniors at the college, said, we are interested primarily in finding people who can make exceptional progress in management work. For this reason we emphasize qualities of character, intelligence, and personality far more than specific educational background. Apprenticeship proposed. Proposing a system of apprenticing students in offices, stores and industrial occupations during the summer vacation, Mr. Moore asserts that after the first two or three years of college, every student should be asked to choose a definite future course and to call a halt if the student has been merely pleasantly drifting without purpose through an unspecialized academic curriculum. Colleges and universities must face the practical consideration that all professions and occupations now demand specialists, he said, urging that educational institutions accept more direct responsibility for vocational guidance. One of the most reliable and practical sources of knowledge available to those who need specialized training is the night schools operated in most large cities. And correspondence schools give specialized training anywhere the U.S. mails go, on all subjects, that can be taught by the extension method. America is also blessed with an abundance of self-study books, courses, and other materials which one may use to acquire specialized training and knowledge. One advantage, in particular, of self-study training is the flexibility of the study program which permits one to study during spare time, during work breaks, or during travel. Anything acquired without effort and without cost is generally unappreciated, often discredited. Perhaps this is why we get so little from our marvelous opportunity in public schools. The self-discipline one receives from a definite program of specialized study makes up, to some extent, for the wasted opportunity, when knowledge was available without cost. I learned this from experience early in my career. I enrolled for a home study course in advertising. After completing eight or ten lessons I stopped studying, but the school did not stop sending me bills. Moreover, it insisted upon payment, whether I kept up my studies or not. I decided that, if I had to pay for the course, which I had legally obligated myself to do, I should complete the lessons and get my money's worth. I felt at the time that the collection system of the school was somewhat too well organized, but I learned later in life that it was a valuable part of my training for which no charge had been made. Being forced to pay, I went ahead and completed the course. Later in life I discovered that the efficient collection system of that school had been worth much to me in the form of money I would later earn because of the training in advertising I had so reluctantly taken. We have in this country the greatest public school system in the world. We have invested fabulous sums for fine buildings. We have provided convenient transportation for children living in rural and other areas. But there is one astounding weakness to this marvelous system, it is free. One of the strange things about human beings is that they value only that which is a price. The free schools of America and the free public libraries do not impress people because they are free or appear to be so. This is the major reason why so many people find it necessary to acquire additional training after they quit school and go to work. It is also one of the major reasons why employers give greater consideration to employees who participate regularly in self-study courses and other forms of professional development. They have learned from experience that any person who has the ambition to give up a part of his or her spare time or to use slack time at work for professional development has those qualities which make for leadership. This recognition is not a charitable gesture. It is sound business judgment upon the part of the employers there is one weakness in people for which there is no remedy. It is the universal weakness of lack of ambition. People, especially those on salary, who schedule their spare time and slack time to provide for self-improvement seldom remain at the bottom very long. Their action opens the way for the upward climb, removes many obstacles from their path, and gains the friendly interest of those who have the power to put them in the way of opportunity.
The self-improvement or home study method of training is especially suited to the needs of employed people who find, after leaving school, that they must acquire additional specialized knowledge, but cannot spare the time to go back to school. The changed economic conditions that now prevail have made it necessary for thousands of people to find additional or new sources of income. For the majority of these, the solution to their problem may be found only by acquiring specialized knowledge. Many will be forced to change their occupation entirely. When merchants find that a certain line of merchandise is not selling, they usually supplant it with another that is in demand. The person whose business is that of marketing personal services must also be an efficient merchant. If the services do not bring adequate returns in one occupation, the individual must change to another where broader opportunities are available. Stuart Austin Wire prepared himself as a construction engineer and followed this line of work until the depression limited his market to where it did not give him the income he required. He took inventory of himself, decided to change his profession to law, went back to school, and took special courses by which he prepared himself as a corporation lawyer. Despite the fact the depression had not ended, he completed his training, passed the bar examination, and quickly built a lucrative law practice in Dallas, Texas. He actually had to turn away clients. Just to keep the record straight, and to anticipate the alibis of those who will say, I couldn't go to school, because I have a family to support, or I'm too old, I will add, that Mr. Wire was. Past 40 and married, when he went back to school. Moreover, by carefully selecting highly specialized courses, in colleges best prepared to teach the subjects chosen, Mr. Wire completed in two years the work for which the majority of law students require four years. It pays to know how to purchase knowledge. The person who stops studying merely because he or she has finished school is forever hopelessly doomed to mediocrity, no matter what that person's calling. The way of success is the way of continuous pursuit of knowledge. Let us consider a specific instance. During the depression a salesman in a grocery store found himself without a position. Having had some bookkeeping experience, he took a special course in accounting, familiarized himself with all the latest bookkeeping and office equipment, and went into business for himself. Starting with a grocer for whom he had formerly worked, he made contracts with more than 100 small merchants to keep their books at a very nominal monthly fee. His idea was so practical that he soon found it necessary to set up a portable office in a light delivery truck, which he equipped with modern bookkeeping equipment. He went on to create a fleet of these bookkeeping offices on wheels, and he employed a large staff of assistants, thus providing small merchants with accounting service equal to the best that money could buy, at very nominal cost. Specialized knowledge, plus imagination, were the ingredients that went into this unique and successful business. In only a short time, the owner of that business was paying an income tax of almost 10 times as much as was paid by the merchant for whom he worked, when the depression forced upon him a temporary adversity which proved to be a blessing in disguise. The beginning of this successful business was an idea. Inasmuch as I had the privilege of supplying the unemployed salesman with that idea, I now assume the further privilege of suggesting another idea which has within it the possibility of significant income as well as the possibility of rendering useful service to thousands of people who badly need that service. The idea was initially suggested by the salesman who gave up selling and went into the business of keeping books on a wholesale basis. When that plan was suggested as a solution to his unemployment problem, he quickly exclaimed, I like the idea, but I would not know how to turn it into cash. In other words, he complained he would not know how to market his bookkeeping knowledge after he acquired it. So that brought up another problem which had to be solved. With the aid of a creative young woman, a typist, who was clever at hand lettering and who could put the story together, he was able to prepare a very attractive portfolio describing the advantages of the new system of bookkeeping. She typed the pages neatly and pasted them in an ordinary scrapbook, which was used as a silent salesman with which the story of this new business was told so effectively that its owner soon had more accounts than he could handle. There are thousands of people today in communities all over the country 
who could use the services of a merchandising specialist such as this woman, capable of preparing attractive materials for use in marketing personal services. The aggregate annual income from such a service might easily exceed that received by an employment agency, and the benefits of the service might be made far greater to the purchaser than any to be obtained from an employment agency. For the idea here described was born of necessity, to meet an emergency which had to be covered, but it did not stop by merely serving one person. The woman who created the idea had a keen imagination. She saw in her newly born brainchild the making of a new profession, one that would render valuable service to thousands of people who need it. Practical Guidance in Marketing Personal Services Spurred to action by the instantaneous success of the first marketing plan for personal services she prepared, this energetic woman turned next to the solution of a similar problem for her son, who had just finished college, but had been totally unable to find a market for his services. The plan she originated for his use was the finest specimen of merchandising of personal services I have ever seen. When the plan portfolio had been completed, it contained nearly 50 pages of beautifully typed, properly organized information, telling the story of her son's native ability, schooling, personal experiences, and a great variety of other information too extensive for description here. The portfolio also contained a complete description of the position her son desired, together with a marvelous word picture of the exact plan he would use in filling the position. The preparation of the portfolio required several weeks' labor, during which time its creator sent her son to the public library almost daily to procure information needed to sell his services to best advantage. She sent him also to all the competitors of his prospective employer to gather from them vital information concerning their business methods, which was of great value in the formation of the plan he intended to use in filling the position he sought. When the plan was finished, it contained more than half a dozen excellent suggestions for the use and benefit of the prospective employer. The suggestions were put into use by the company. One may be inclined to ask, why go to all this trouble to secure a job? The answer is straight to the point, also dramatic, because it deals with a subject which assumes the proportion of a tragedy with millions of men and women whose sole source of income is personal services. The answer is, doing a thing well never is trouble. The plan prepared by this woman for the benefit of her son helped him get the job for which he applied, at the first interview, at a salary fixed by himself. Moreover, and this too, is important, the position did not require the young man to start at the bottom. He began as a junior executive, at an executive salary. Why go to all this trouble, you ask? Well, for one thing, the planned presentation of this young man's application for a position clipped off no less than 10 years of time he would have required to get to where he began, had he started at the bottom and worked his way up. This idea of starting at the bottom and working one's way up may appear to be sound, but the major objection to it is this, too many of those who begin at the bottom never manage to lift their heads high enough to be seen by opportunity, so they remain at the bottom. It should be remembered also, that the outlook from the bottom is not so very bright or encouraging. It has a tendency to kill off ambition. We call it getting into a rut, which means that we accept our fate because we form the habit of daily routine, a habit that finally becomes so strong we cease to try to throw it off. And that is another reason why it pays to start one or two steps above the bottom. By so doing, one forms the habit of looking around, of observing how others get ahead, of seeing opportunity, and of embracing it without hesitation. Dan Halpin is a splendid example of what I mean. During his college days, he was manager of the famous national championship Notre Dame football team when it was under the direction of Newt Rockney. Perhaps he was inspired by the great football coach to aim high and not mistake temporary defeat for failure, just as Andrew Carnegie, the great industrial leader, inspired his young business lieutenants to set high goals for themselves. At any rate, young Halpin finished college at a mighty unfavorable time, when the depression had made jobs scarce, so, after a fling at investment banking and motion. Pictures, he took the first opening with a potential future he could find, selling hearing aids on a commission basis. Anyone could start in that sort of job, and Halpin knew it, but it was enough to open the door of opportunity to him. For almost two years he continued in a job not to his liking, 
and he would never have risen above that job if he had not done something about his dissatisfaction. He aimed first at the job of assistant sales manager of his company and got the job. That one step upward placed him high enough above the crowd to enable him to see still greater opportunity. Also, it placed him where opportunity could see him. He made such a fine record selling hearing aids that A.M. Andrews, chairman of the board of the Dictograph Products Company, a business competitor of the company for which Halpin worked, wanted to know something about that man, Dan Halpin who was taking big sales away from the long-established Dictograph Company. He sent for Halpin. When the interview was over, Halpin was the new sales manager in charge of Dictograph's acoustic division. Then to test young Halpin's metal, Mr. Andrews went away to Florida for three months, leaving him to sink or swim in his new job. He did not sink. Newt Rockne's spirit of all the world loves a winner and has no time for a loser inspired him to put so much into his job that he was eventually elected vice president of the company and general manager of the acoustic in and silent radio division, a job most executives would be proud to earn through 10 years of loyal effort. Halpin turned the trick in little more than six months. It is difficult to say whether Mr. Andrews or Mr. Halpin is more deserving of eulogy for the reason that both showed evidence of having an abundance of that very rare quality known as imagination. Mr. Andrews deserves credit for seeing in young Halpin a go-getter of the highest order. Halpin deserves credit for refusing to compromise with life by accepting and keeping a job he did not want, and that is one of the major points I am trying to emphasize through this entire philosophy, that we rise to high positions or remain at the bottom because of conditions we can control if we desire to control them. I am also trying to emphasize another point, namely, that both success and failure are largely the results of habit. I have not the slightest doubt that Dan Halpin's close association with the greatest football coach America ever knew planted in his mind the same brand of desire to excel which made the Notre Dame football team world famous. Truly, there is something to the idea that hero worship is helpful, provided one worships a winner. Halpin told me that Rockne was one of the world's greatest leaders in all of history. My belief in the theory that business associations are vital factors, both in failure and in success, was demonstrated when my son Blair was negotiating with Dan Halpin for a position. Mr. Halpin offered him a beginning salary of about one half, what he could have gotten from a rival company. I brought parental pressure to bear and induced him to accept the position with Mr. Halpin because I believe that close association with one who refuses to compromise with circumstances he does not like is an asset that can never be measured in terms of money. The bottom is a monotonous, dreary, unprofitable place for any person. That is why I have taken the time to describe how lowly beginnings may be circumvented by proper planning. That is why so much space has been devoted to the story about the woman who ended up creating a whole new business as a result of being inspired to do a fine job of planning so that her son could get a favorable break. Perhaps some will find in the kind of ideas here briefly describe the nucleus of the riches they desire. Simple ideas have been the seedlings from which great fortunes have grown in America. Woolworth's 5 and 10 cent store idea, 4. Example was so simple at the time as to be almost unworthy of consideration, but it piled up a fortune for its creator. There is no fixed price for sound ideas. Back of all ideas is specialized knowledge. Unfortunately, for those who do not find riches in abundance, specialized knowledge is more abundant and more easily acquired than ideas. Capability means imagination the one quality needed to combine specialized knowledge with ideas in the form of organized plans designed to yield riches. If you have imagination, the stories that have been told in this chapter may stimulate you to come up with an idea sufficient to serve as the beginning of the riches you desire. Remember, the idea is the main thing. Specialized knowledge may be found just around the corner, any corner, but imagination is the catalyst that unites a good idea with the specialized knowledge required to translate it into success. Anybody can wish for riches, and most people do, but only a few know that a definite plan, plus a burning desire for wealth, are the only dependable means of accumulating wealth. The only limitation is that which one sets up. In one's own mind. Chapter 5. Imagination. 
The workshop of the mind. The fifth step to riches. The imagination is literally the workshop wherein are fashioned all plans created by humankind. The impulse, the desire, is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. It has been said that anything can be created which a human being can imagine. Of all the ages of civilization, the one in which we live is the most favorable for the development of the imagination because it is an age of rapid change. On every hand we may contact stimuli which develop the imagination. Through the aid of the imaginative faculty, we have discovered and harnessed more of nature's forces during the past 50 years than during the entire history of the human race previous to that time. We have conquered the air so completely that the birds are a poor match for us in flying. We have harnessed the electromagnetic spectrum and made it serve as a means of instantaneous communication with any part of the world. We have analyzed and weighed the sun at a distance of millions of miles and determined through the aid of imagination the elements of which it consists. We have discovered that our own brains are both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the vibration of thought, although we have only barely begun to understand this phenomenon with the aim of making practical use of this discovery. We have increased the speed of travel until we may now breakfast in New York and lunch in San Francisco. Our only limitation, within reason, lies in our development and use of our imagination. We have not yet reached the apex of development in the use of the imaginative faculty. We have merely discovered that we have an imagination and have commenced to use it only in a very elementary way. Two forms of imagination. The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination and the other is creative imagination. Synthetic imagination, through this faculty, one can arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. This faculty creates nothing. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. It is the faculty used most by the inventor, with the exception of the genius, who draws upon the creative imagination when unable to solve a problem through synthetic imagination. Creative imagination, through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite human mind has direct communication with infinite intelligence. It is the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. One it is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to us. It is through this faculty that thought vibrations or influences from the minds of others are received. It is through this faculty that one individual may tune in or communicate with the subconscious minds of others. The creative imagination works automatically in the manner described in subsequent pages. This faculty functions only when the conscious mind is functioning at an exceedingly high level of intensity or energy, as for example, when the conscious mind is stimulated through the emotion of a strong desire. The creative imagination becomes more alert, more receptive to influences from the sources mentioned, in proportion to its development through use. This statement is significant. Ponder over it before passing on. Keep in mind as you follow these principles that the entire story of how one may convert desire into money cannot be told in one statement. The story will be complete only when one has mastered, assimilated, and begun to make use of all the success principles that are explained and tied together in this book. The great leaders of business, industry, finance, and the great artists, musicians, poets, and writers became great because they developed the faculty of creative imagination. Both the synthetic and creative faculties of imagination become more alert with use, just as any muscle or organ of the body develops through use. Desire is only a thought, an impulse. It is nebulous and ephemeral. It is abstract and of no value until it has been transformed into its physical counterpart. While the synthetic imagination is the one which will be used most frequently in the process of transforming the impulse of desire into money, you must keep in mind the fact that you may face circumstances and situations which demand the use of the creative imagination as well. Your imaginative faculty may have become weak through inaction. It can be revived and made alert through use. This faculty does not die, though it may become dormant through lack of use. Center your attention, for the time being, on developing the synthetic imagination, because this is the faculty which you will use more often in the process of converting desire into money. 
Transforming the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. These plans must be formed with the aid of the imagination, mainly synthetic imagination. Read this entire book through, then come back to this chapter and begin at once to put your imagination to work on building a plan or plans to transform your desire into money. Detailed instructions for building plans have been given in almost every chapter. Carry out the instructions best suited to your needs and reduce your plan to writing if you have not already done so. The moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the intangible desire. Read the preceding sentence once more. Read it aloud, very slowly, and as you do so, remember that the moment you reduce the statement of your desire and a plan for its realization to writing, you have actually taken the first of a series of steps which will enable you to convert the thought into its physical counterpart. The earth on which you live, you yourself, and every other material thing are the result of evolutionary change, through which microscopic bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, every one of the billions of individual cells of your body, and every atom of matter began as an intangible form of energy. Desire is thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin with the thought impulse of desire to accumulate money, or any other object of desire, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth and every material form in the universe, including the body and brain in which the thought impulses function. As far as science has been able to determine, the entire universe consists of but two elements, matter and energy. Through the combination of energy and matter has been created everything which we can perceive, from the largest star which floats in the heavens down to and including ourselves. You are now engaged in the task of trying to profit by nature's method. You are, sincerely and earnestly, we hope, trying to adapt yourself to nature's laws by endeavoring to convert desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. You can do it. It has been done before. You can build a fortune through the aid of laws which are immutable. But first you must become familiar with these laws and learn to use them. Through repetition, and by approaching the description of these principles from every conceivable angle, I hope to reveal to you the secret through which every great fortune has been accumulated. Strange and paradoxical as it may seem, the secret is not a secret. Nature herself advertises it in the earth on which we live, the stars, the planets suspended within our view, in the elements above and around us, in every blade of grass, and in every form of life within our vision. Nature advertises the secret in the terms of biology, in the conversion of a tiny cell, so small that it may be lost on the point of a pin, into the human being now reading this line. The conversion of desire into its physical equivalent is certainly no more miraculous. Do not become discouraged if you do not fully comprehend all that has been stated. Unless you have long been a student of the mind, it is not to be expected that you will assimilate all that is in this chapter upon a first reading. But you will, in time, make good progress. The principles that follow will open the way for understanding of imagination. Assimilate that which you understand as you read this philosophy for the first time, then when you reread and study it, you will discover that something has happened to clarify it and give you a broader understanding of the whole. Above all, do not stop nor hesitate in your study of these principles until you have read the book at least three times, for then you will not want to stop. How to make practical use of imagination. Ideas are the beginning points of all fortunes. Ideas are products of the imagination. Let us examine a few well-known ideas which have yielded huge fortunes, with the hope that these illustrations will convey definite information concerning the method by which imagination may be used in accumulating riches. The Enchanted Kettle. Fifty years ago, an old country doctor drove to town, hitched his horse, quietly slipped into a drugstore by the back door, and began dickering with a young drug clerk. His mission was destined to yield great wealth to many people. It was destined to bring to the South the most far-flung benefits since the Civil War. For more than an hour, behind the prescription counter, the old doctor and the clerk talked in low tones. Then the doctor left. He went out to the buggy and brought back a large, old-fashioned kettle, a big wooden paddle, 
used for stirring the contents of the kettle, and deposited them in the back of the store. The clerk inspected the kettle, reached into his inside pocket, took out a roll of bills, and handed it over to the doctor. The roll contained exactly 500, the clerk's entire savings. The doctor handed over a small slip of paper on which was written a secret formula. The words on that small slip of paper were worth a king's ransom. But not to the doctor. Those magic words were needed to start the kettle to boiling, but neither the doctor nor the young clerk knew what fabulous fortunes were destined to flow from that kettle. The old doctor was glad to sell the outfit for 500. The money would pay off his debts and give him freedom of mind. The clerk was taking a big chance by staking his entire life savings on a mere scrap of paper and an old kettle. He never dreamed his investment would start a kettle to overflowing with gold that would surpass the miraculous performance of Aladdin's lamp. What the clerk really purchased was an idea. The old kettle and the wooden paddle and the secret message on a slip of paper were incidental. The strange performance of that kettle began to take place after the new owner mixed with the secret instructions an ingredient of which the doctor knew nothing. Read this story carefully and give your imagination a test. See if you can discover what it was that the young man added to the secret message that caused the kettle to overflow with gold. Remember as you read that this is not a story from Arabian Nights. Here you have a story of facts, stranger than fiction, facts which began in the form of an idea. Let us take a look at the vast fortunes of gold this idea has produced. It has paid, and still pays, huge fortunes to men and women all over the world who distribute the contents of the kettle to millions of people. The old kettle is now one of the world's largest consumers of sugar, thus providing jobs of a permanent nature to thousands of men and women engaged in growing sugar cane, beets, other sugar-producing crops, and in refining and marketing sugar. The old kettle consumes millions and millions of bottles and cans each year, providing jobs to huge numbers of workers who manufacture those containers. The old kettle gives employment to an army of clerks, stenographers, copywriters, and advertising experts throughout the nation. It has brought fame and fortune to scores of artists who have created magnificent pictures and ads describing the product. The old kettle converted a small southern city into the business capital of the South, where it now benefits, directly or indirectly, every business and practically every resident of the city. The influence of this idea now benefits every civilized country in the world, pouring out a continuous stream of gold to all who touch it. Gold from the kettle has built and maintains one of the most prominent universities of the South, where thousands of young people receive the training essential for success. The old kettle has done other marvelous things. All during the Depression, when factories, banks and businesses were folding up and quitting by the thousands, the owner of this enchanted kettle went marching on, giving continuous employment to an army of men and women all over the world, and paying out extra portions of gold to those who long ago had faith in the idea. If the product of that old brass kettle could talk, it would tell thrilling tales of romance in every language. Romances of love, romances of business, romances of professional men and women who are daily being stimulated by it. I am sure of at least one such romance, for I was a part of it, and it all began not far from the very spot on which the drug clerk purchased the old kettle. It was here that I met my wife, and it was she who first told me of the enchanted kettle. It was the product of that kettle we were drinking when I asked her to accept me for better or worse. Whoever you are, wherever you may live, whatever occupation you may be engaged in, just remember in the future, every time you see the words Coca-Cola, that its vast empire of wealth and influence grew out of a single idea, and that the mysterious ingredient which the drug clerk, Asa Candler, mixed with the secret formula was imagination. Stop and think of that for a moment. Remember also that the 13 steps to riches described in this book were the media through which the influence of Coca-Cola has been extended to every city, town, village, and crossroads of the world, and that any idea you may create, which is as sound and meritorious as Coca-Cola, has the possibility of duplicating the stupendous record of this worldwide thirst quencher. Truly, thoughts are things, and their scope of operation is the world itself. What I would do, if I had a million dollars. The following story proves the truth of the old saying, where there's a will, 
there's a way. It was told to me by that beloved educator and clergyman, the late Frank W. Gonzalez, who began his preaching career in the Stockyards region of South Chicago. While Dr. Gonzalez was going through college, he observed many defects in our educational system, defects which he believed he could correct if he were the head of a college. His deepest desire was to become the head of an educational institution in which young men and women would be taught to learn by doing. He made up his mind to organize a new college in which he could carry out his ideas without being handicapped by orthodox methods of education. He needed a million dollars to put the project across. Where was he to lay his hands on so large a sum of money? That was the question that absorbed most of this ambitious young preacher's thought. But he couldn't seem to make any progress. Every night he took that thought to bed with him. He got up with it in the morning. He took it with him everywhere he went. He turned it over and over in his mind until it became a consuming obsession with him. A million dollars is a lot of money. He recognized that fact, but he also recognized the truth that the only limitation is that which one sets up in one's own mind. Being a philosopher as well as a preacher, Dr. Gonzalez recognized, as do all who succeed in life, that definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which one must begin. He recognized too, that definiteness of purpose takes on animation, life, and power when backed by a burning desire to translate that purpose into its material equivalent. He knew all these great truths, yet he did not know where or how to lay his hands on a million dollars. The natural procedure would have been to give up and quit by saying, oh well, my idea is a good one, but I cannot do anything with it because I never can procure the necessary million dollars. That is exactly what the majority of people would have said, but it is not what Dr. Gunsala said. What he said and what he did are so important that I now introduce him and let him speak for himself. One Saturday afternoon I sat in my room thinking of ways and means of raising the money to carry out my plans. For nearly two years I had been thinking, but I had done nothing but think. The time had come for action. I made up my mind, then and there, that I would get the necessary million dollars within a week. How? I was not concerned about that. The thing of importance was the decision to get the money within a specified time, and I want to tell you, that the moment I reached a definite decision to get the money within a specified time, a strange feeling of assurance came over me such as I had never before experienced. Something inside me seemed to say, why didn't you reach that decision a long time ago? The money was waiting for you all the time. Things began to happen in a hurry. I called the newspapers and announced I would preach a sermon the following morning entitled, What I Would Do, If I Had a Million Dollars. I went to work on the sermon immediately, but I must tell you frankly the task was not difficult, because I had been preparing that sermon for almost two years. The spirit back of it was a part of me. Long before midnight I had finished writing the sermon. I went to bed and slept with a feeling of confidence, for I could see myself already in possession of the million dollars. Next morning I arose early, went into the bathroom, read the sermon, then knelt on my knees and asked that my sermon might come to the attention of someone who would supply the needed money. While I was praying, I again had that feeling of assurance that the money would be forthcoming. In my excitement, I walked out without my sermon and did not discover the oversight until I was in my pulpit and about ready to begin delivering it. It was too late to go back for my notes, and what a blessing that I couldn't go back. Instead, my own subconscious mind yielded the material I needed. When I rose to begin my sermon, I closed my eyes and spoke with all my heart and soul of my dreams. I not only talked to my audience, but I fancy I talked also to God. I told what I would do with a million dollars if that amount were placed in my hands. I described the plan I had in mind for organizing a great educational institution where young people would learn to do practical things and at the same time develop their minds. When I had finished and sat down, a man slowly arose from his seat, about three rows from the rear, and made his way toward the pulpit. I wondered what he was going to do. He came into the pulpit, extended his hand, and said, Reverend, I liked your sermon. I believe you can do everything you said you would, if you had a million dollars. To prove that I believe in you and your sermon, if you will come to my office tomorrow morning, I will give you the million dollars. 
My name is Philip D. Armour. Young Gonzalez went to Mr. Armour's office, and the million dollars was presented to him. With the money he found at the Armour Institute of Technology. That is more money than the majority of preachers ever see in an entire lifetime, yet the thought impulse back of the money was created in the young preacher's mind in a fraction of a minute. The necessary million dollars came as a result of an idea. Back of the idea was a desire which young Gonzales had been nursing in his mind for almost two years. Observe this important fact, he got the money within 36 hours after he reached a definite decision in his own mind to get it and decided upon a definite plan for getting it. There was nothing new or unique about young Gonzales's vague thinking about a million dollars and weakly hoping for it. Others before him, and many since his time, have had similar thoughts. But there was something unique and different about the decision he reached on that memorable Saturday, when he put vagueness into the background and said definitely, I will get that money within a week. God seems to throw himself on the side of people who know exactly what they want, if they are determined to get just that. Moreover, the principle through which Dr. Gonzalez got his million dollars is still alive. It is available to you. This universal law is as workable today as it was when the young preacher made use of it so successfully. This book describes, step by step, the 13 elements of this great law and suggests how they may be put to use. Observe that Asa Candler and Drive. Frank Gonzalez had one characteristic in common. Both knew the astounding truth that ideas can be transmuted into cash through the power of definite purpose plus definite plans. If you are one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought. It is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands, based upon the application of definite principles, and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is an impulse of thought that impels action by an appeal to the imagination. All master salespeople know that ideas can be sold where merchandise cannot. Ordinary salespeople do not know this that is why they are ordinary. A publisher of books which sell for a few dollars made a discovery that should be worth much to publishers generally. He learned that many people buy titles and not contents of books. By merely changing the name of one book that was not moving, his sales on that book jumped upward more than a million copies. The inside of the book was not changed in any way. He merely ripped off the cover bearing the title that did not sell and put on a new cover with a title that had box office value. That, as simple as it may seem, was an idea. It was imagination at work. There is no standard price on ideas. Creators of ideas make their own price and, if they are smart, get it. The movie industry created a whole flock of millionaires. Most of them were individuals who couldn't create ideas, but they had the imagination to recognize ideas when they saw them. The story of practically every great fortune starts with the day when a creator of ideas and a seller of ideas get together and work in harmony. Carnegie surrounded himself with people who could do all that he could not do, people who created ideas and people who put ideas into operation, and by so doing made himself and the others fabulously rich. Millions of people go through life hoping for favorable breaks. Perhaps a favorable break can get one an opportunity, but the safest plan is not to depend upon luck. It was a favorable break that gave me the biggest opportunity of my life, but 25 years of determined effort had to be devoted to that opportunity before it became an asset. The break consisted of my good fortune in meeting and gaining the cooperation of Andrew Carnegie. On that occasion, Carnegie planted in my mind the idea of organizing the principles of achievement into a philosophy of success. Thousands of people have profited by the discoveries made in the 25 years of research, and numerous fortunes have been accumulated through the application of the philosophy. The beginning was simple. It was an idea which anyone might have developed. The favorable break came through Andrew Carnegie, but what about the determination, definiteness of purpose, the desire to attain the goal, and the persistent effort of 25 years? It was no ordinary desire that survived disappointment, discouragement, temporary defeat, criticism, and the constant reminding of waste of time. It was a burning desire. An obsession. 
When the idea was first planted in my mind by Mr. Carnegie, it was coaxed, nursed, and enticed to remain alive. Gradually, the idea became a giant, under its own power, and it coaxed, nursed, and drove me. Ideas are like that. First you give life and action and guidance to ideas, then they take on power of their own and sweep aside all opposition. Ideas are intangible forces, but they have more power than the physical brains that give birth to them. They have the power to live on, after the brain, that creates them has returned to dust. For example, take the power of Christianity. That began with a simple idea. Its chief tenet was, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Christ has gone back to the source from whence he came, but his idea goes marching on. Someday, it may come fully into its own. Then it will have fulfilled Christ's deepest desire. The idea has been developing only some 2,000 years. Give it time. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands, based upon the application of definite principles, and not by chance or luck. Success requires no apologies. Failure permits no alibis. Chapter 6. Organize Planning. The Crystallization of Desire into Action. The Sixth Step to Riches. You have learned that everything worthwhile that an individual creates or acquires begins in the form of desire, and that the first step of desire's journey from the abstract to the concrete is into the workshop of the imagination, where plans for desire's transition are created and organized. In Chapter 1 you are instructed to take six definite, practical actions as your first move, in translating the desire for money into its monetary equivalent. One of these steps is the formation of a definite, practical plan or plans through which this transformation may be made. You will now be instructed on how to build plans which will be practical, namely, a. Ally yourself with a group of as many people as you may need to create and carry out your plan or plans for the accumulation of money. To do this, you will make use of the mastermind principle, which is described in Chapter 9. Compliance with this instruction is absolutely essential. Do not neglect it. b. Before forming your mastermind alliance, decide what advantages and benefits you may offer the individual members of your group in return for their cooperation. No one will work indefinitely without some form of compensation. No intelligent person will either request or expect another to work without adequate compensation, although this may not always be in the form of money. c. Arrange to meet with the members of your mastermind group at least twice a week, and more often if possible, until you have jointly perfected the necessary plan or plans for the accumulation of money. d. Maintain perfect harmony between yourself and every member of your mastermind group. If you fail to carry out this instruction to the letter, you may expect to meet with failure. The mastermind principle cannot obtain where perfect harmony does not prevail. Keep in mind these two facts, first. You are engaged in an undertaking of major importance to you. To be sure of success, you must have plans which are faultless. Second, you must have the advantage of the experience, education, native ability, and imagination of other minds. This is in harmony with the methods followed by every person who has accumulated a great fortune. No individual has sufficient experience, education, native ability, and knowledge to ensure the accumulation of a great fortune without the cooperation of other people. Every plan you adopt in your endeavor to accumulate wealth should be the joint creation of yourself and every other member of your mastermind group. You may originate your own plans, either in whole or in part, but see that those plans are checked and approved by the members of your mastermind alliance. If the first plan which you adopt does not work successfully, replace it with a new plan. If this new plan fails to work, replace it in turn with still another, and so on until you find a plan which does work. Right here is the point at which the majority of people meet with failure, because of their lack of persistence, in creating new plans to take the place of those which fail. The most intelligent individual cannot succeed in accumulating money or in any other undertaking without plans which are practical and workable. Just keep this fact in mind and remember, when your plans fail, that temporary defeat is not permanent failure. It may only mean that your plans have not been sound. Build other plans. 
Start over again. Thomas A. Edison failed 10,000 times before he perfected the incandescent electric light bulb, that is, he met with temporary defeat 10,000 times before his efforts were crowned with success. Temporary defeat should mean only one thing, the certain knowledge that there is something wrong with your plan. Millions of people go through life in misery and poverty because they lack a sound plan through which to accumulate a fortune. Henry Ford accumulated a fortune, not because of his superior mind, but because he adopted and followed a plan which proved to be sound. A thousand individuals could be pointed out, each with a better education than Ford's, yet each of whom lives in poverty, because he or she does not possess the right plan for the accumulation of money. Your achievement can be no greater than your plans are sound. That may seem to be an axiomatic statement, but it is true. And no one is ever whipped until that person quits, in his or her own mind. This fact will be repeated many times, because it is so easy to take the count at the first sign of defeat. James J. Hill met with temporary defeat when he first endeavored to raise the necessary capital to build a railroad. From the east to the west, but he too, turned defeat into victory through new plans. Henry Ford met with temporary defeat, not only at the beginning of his automobile career, but after he had gone far toward the top. He created new plans and went marching on to financial victory. We see people who have accumulated great fortunes, but we often recognize only their triumph, overlooking the temporary defeats which they had to surmount before arriving. No follower of this philosophy can reasonably expect to accumulate a fortune without experiencing temporary defeat. When defeat comes, accept it as a signal that your plans are not sound, rebuild those plans, and set sail once more toward your coveted goal. If you give up before your goal has been reached, you are a quitter. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Lift this sentence out, write it on a piece of paper in letters an inch high, and place it where you will see it every night before you go to sleep, and every morning before you go to work. When you begin to select members for your mastermind group, endeavor to select those who do not take defeat seriously. Some people foolishly believe that only money can make money. This is not true. Desire, transmuted into its monetary equivalent, through the principles laid down here, is the agency through which money is made. Money, of itself, is nothing but inert matter. It cannot move, think, or talk, but it can hear when a person who desires it calls it to come. Planning the sale of services, the remainder of this chapter, is given over to a description of ways and means of marketing personal services. The information here conveyed will be of practical help to any person, having any form of personal services to market, but it will be of priceless benefit to those who aspire to leadership in their chosen occupations. Intelligent planning is essential for success in any undertaking designed to accumulate riches. The following pages provide detailed instructions to those who must begin the accumulation of riches by selling personal services. It should be encouraging to know that practically all the great fortunes began in the form of compensation for personal services or from the sale of ideas. What else, except ideas and personal services, would one who owns little property have to give in return for riches? Broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. One type is known as leaders and the other as followers. Decide at the outset whether you intend to become a leader in your chosen calling or remain a follower. The difference in compensation is vast. The follower cannot reasonably expect the compensation to which a leader is entitled, although many followers make the mistake of expecting such pay. It is no disgrace to be a follower. On the other hand, it is no credit to remain a follower. Most great leaders began in the capacity of followers. They became great leaders because they were intelligent followers. With few exceptions, the person who cannot follow a leader intelligently cannot become an efficient leader. The person who can follow a leader most efficiently is usually the one who develops into leadership most rapidly. An intelligent follower has many advantages, among them the opportunity to acquire knowledge from his or her leader. The 11 major factors of leadership, the following are important attributes of leadership. Unwavering courage based upon knowledge of self and of one's occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. No intelligent follower will be dominated by such a leader very long. 
Self-control. The person who lacks self-control can never control others. Self-control sets a mighty example for one's followers, which the more intelligent will emulate. A keen sense of justice. Without a sense of fairness and justice, no leader can command and retain the respect of his or her followers. Definiteness of decision. Individuals who waver in their decisions show that they are not sure of themselves. They cannot lead others successfully. Definiteness of plans. Successful leaders must plan their work and work their plan. Leaders who move by guesswork, without practical, definite plans, are comparable to a ship without a rudder. Sooner or later they will land on the rocks. The habit of doing more than paid for. One of the penalties of leadership is the necessity of willingness, upon the part of leaders, to do more than they require of their followers. A pleasing personality. No slovenly careless person can become a successful leader. Leadership calls for respect. Followers will not respect a leader who does not grade high on all of the factors of a pleasing personality. Sympathy and understanding. Successful leaders must be in sympathy with their followers. Moreover, they must understand them and their problems. Mastery of detail. Successful leadership calls for mastery of details of the leader's position. Willingness to assume full responsibility. Successful leaders must be willing to assume responsibility for the mistakes and the shortcomings of their followers. If they try to shift this responsibility, they will not remain the leader. If one of their followers makes a mistake and demonstrates incompetence, leaders must consider that it is they themselves who failed. Cooperation. Successful leaders must understand and apply the principle of cooperative effort and be able to induce their followers to do the same. Leadership calls for power and power calls for cooperation. There are two forms of leadership. The first, by far the most effective, is leadership by consent of, and with the sympathy of, the followers. The second is leadership by force, without the consent and sympathy of the followers. History is filled with evidence that leadership by force cannot endure. The downfall and disappearance of dictators and kings is significant. It means that people will not follow forced leadership indefinitely. The world has just entered a new era of relationship between leaders and followers, which very clearly calls for new leaders and a new brand of leadership in business and industry. Those who belong to the old school of leadership by force must acquire an understanding of the new brand of leadership, cooperation, or be relegated to the rank and file of the followers. There is no other way out for them. The relationship of employer and employee, or of leader and follower, in the future, will be one of mutual cooperation, based upon an equitable division of the profits of business. In the future, the relationship of employer and employee will be more like a partnership than it has been in the past. Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, and the King of Spain were examples of leadership by force. Their leadership passed. Without much difficulty, one might point to the prototypes of these ex-leaders among the business, financial, and labor leaders of America who have been dethroned or slated to go. Leadership by consent, of the followers, is the only brand which can endure. People may follow the forced leadership temporarily, but they will not do so willingly. The new brand of leadership will embrace the 11 major factors of leadership described in this chapter, as well as some other factors. The individual who makes these the basis of his or her leadership will find abundant opportunity to lead in any walk of life. The difficult economic times we have faced have been prolonged in large part because the world lacked leadership of the new brand. Now the demand for leaders who are competent to apply the new methods of leadership has greatly exceeded the supply. Some of the old type of leaders will reform and adapt themselves to the new brand of leadership, but generally speaking, the world will have to look for new timber for its leadership. This necessity may be your opportunity. The 10 Major Causes of Failure in Leadership We come now to the major faults of leaders who fail, because it is just as essential to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. Inability to Organize Details Efficient leadership calls for ability to organize and to master details. Genuine leaders are never too busy to do anything which may be required of them in their capacity as leaders. Whenever people, whether they are leader or follower, admit that they are too busy to change their plans or to give attention to any emergency, 
they admit their inefficiency. Successful leaders must be the master of all details connected with their position. That means, of course, that they must acquire the habit of delegating details to capable lieutenants. Unwillingness to render humble service. Truly great leaders are willing when the occasion demands to perform any sort of labor which they would ask another to perform. The greatest among you shall be the servant of all is a truth which all able leaders observe and respect. Expectation of pay for what they know, instead of what they do with that which they know. The world does not pay people for that which they know. It pays them for what they do, or induce others to do. Fear of competition from followers. Leaders who fear that one of their followers may take their position are practically sure to realize that fear sooner or later. Able leaders train understudies to whom they may delegate, at will, any of the details of their position. Only in this way can leaders multiply themselves and prepare themselves to be at many places and give attention to many things at one time. It is an eternal truth that people receive more pay for their ability to get others to perform than they could possibly earn by their own efforts. Efficient leaders may, through their knowledge of their job and the magnetism of their personality, greatly increase the efficiency of others and induce them to render more service and better service than they could render without the leader's aid. Lack of imagination. Without imagination, leaders are incapable of meeting emergencies and of creating plans by which to guide their followers efficiently. Selfishness. Leaders who claim all the honor for the work of their followers are sure to be met by resentment. Great leaders claim none of the honors. They are contented to see the honors, when there are any, go to their followers, because they know that most people will work harder for commendation and recognition than they will for money alone. Intemperance. Followers do not respect an intemperate leader. Moreover, intemperance in any of its various forms destroys the endurance and the vitality of all who indulge in it. Disloyalty. Perhaps this should have come at the head of the list. Leaders who are not loyal to their trust and to their associates, those above and those below, cannot long maintain their leadership. Disloyalty marks one as being less than the dust of the earth and brings down on one's head the contempt he or she deserves. Lack of loyalty is one of the major causes of failure in every walk of life. Overemphasis on the authority of leadership. Efficient leaders lead by encouraging and not by trying to instill fear in the hearts of their followers. Leaders who try to impress their followers with their authority come within the category of leadership by force. If leaders are real leaders, they will have no need to advertise that fact except by their conduct, their sympathy, understanding, fairness, and a demonstration that they know their job. Overemphasis on title. Competent leaders require no title to give them the respect of their followers. The individual who makes too much over his or her title generally has little else to emphasize. The doors to the office of real leaders are open to all who wish to enter, and their working quarters are free from formality or ostentation. These are among the more common of the causes of failure in leadership. Any one of these faults is sufficient to induce failure. Study the list carefully if you aspire to leadership and make sure that you are free of these faults. Some fertile fields in which new leadership will be required. Before leaving this chapter, your attention is called to a few of the fertile fields in which there has been a decline of leadership and in which the new type of leader may find an abundance of opportunity. First, in the field of politics there is a most insistent demand for new leaders, a demand which indicates nothing less than an emergency. The majority of politicians have seemingly become high-grade, legalized racketeers. They have increased axes and debauched the machinery of industry and business until the people can no longer stand the burden. Second, the banking business is undergoing a reform. The leaders in this field have almost entirely lost the confidence of the public. Already the bankers have sensed the need of reform, and they have begun it. Third, industry calls for new leaders. The old type of leaders thought and moved in terms of dividends, instead of thinking and moving in terms of human equations. Future leaders in industry, to endure, must regard themselves as quasi-public officials whose duty it is to manage their trust in such a way that it will work hardship on no individual or group of individuals. Exploitation of working people is a thing of the past. Let the man or woman who aspires to leadership in the field of business 
industry, and labor remember this. Fourth, religious leaders of the future must give more attention to the temporal needs of their followers in the solution of their present economic and personal problems and less attention to the dead past and the yet unborn future. Fifth, in the professions of law, medicine, and education, a new brand of leadership, and to some extent new leaders, will become a necessity. This is especially true in the field of education. The leader in that field must in the future find ways and means of teaching people how to apply the knowledge they receive in school. The educator must deal more with practice and less with theory. Sixth, new leaders will be required in the field of journalism. Newspapers of the future, to be operated successfully, must be divorced from special privilege and relieved from the subsidy of advertising. They must cease to be organs of propaganda for the interests which patronize their advertising columns. The type of newspaper which publishes scandal and lewd pictures will eventually go the way of all forces which debauch the human mind. These are but a few of the fields in which opportunities for new leaders and a new brand of leadership are now available. The world is undergoing a rapid change. This means that the media through which the changes in human habits are promoted must be adapted to the changes. The media here described are the ones which more than any others determine the trend of civilization. The information to be described next about when and how to apply for a position is the net result of many years of experience during which thousands of men and women were helped to market their services effectively. It can, therefore, be relied upon as sound and practical media through which services may be marketed. Experience has proved that the following media offer the most direct and effective methods of bringing the buyer and seller of personal services together. Employment agencies. Care must be taken to select only reputable agencies, the management of which can show adequate records of achievement of satisfactory results. There are comparatively few such agencies. Advertising in newspapers, trade journals, and magazines. Classified advertising may usually be relied upon to produce satisfactory results in the case of those who apply for clerical or ordinary salary positions. Display advertising is more desirable in the case of those who seek executive connections. The copy should be prepared by an expert who understands how to inject sufficient selling qualities to produce replies. Personal letters of application directed to particular firms or individuals most apt to need such services as are being offered. Letters should be neatly typed, always, and signed by hand with a bold signature. With the letter, should be sent a complete brief or outline of the applicant's qualifications. Both the letter of application and the resume of experience or qualifications should be prepared by an expert, or be of the same quality and appearance as one prepared by an expert. See instructions as to information to be supplied. Application through personal acquaintances. When possible, the applicant should endeavor to approach prospective employers through some mutual acquaintance. This method of approach is particularly advantageous in the case of those who seek executive connections and do not wish to appear to be peddling themselves. 5. Application in person. In some instances, it may be more effective if the applicant offers personally his or her services to prospective employers, in which event a complete written statement of qualifications for the position should be presented, because prospective employers often wish to discuss with associates one's record. 8 musts for an effective resume. A resume should be prepared as carefully as a lawyer would prepare the brief of a case to be tried in court. Unless the applicant is experienced in the preparation of resumes, an expert should be consulted and hired for this purpose. Successful merchants employ men and women who understand the art and the psychology of advertising to present the merits of their merchandise. One who has personal services for sale should do the same. The following eight items of information should appear in the resume. Education. State briefly, but specifically, what education you have had and in what subjects you specialized, giving the reasons for that specialization. Experience. If you have had experience in connection with positions similar to the one you seek, describe it fully and state names and addresses of former employers. Be sure to bring out clearly any special experience you may have had which would equip you to fill the position you seek. References.
Practically every business firm desires to know all about the previous records, antecedents, etc., of prospective employees who seek positions of responsibility. Attach to your resume photostatic copies of letters from former employers, teachers under whom you studied, prominent people whose judgment may be relied upon. Photograph. Attach to your resume a recent unmounted photograph of yourself, or, if your resume is being printed professionally, have the photograph suitably reproduced. Apply for a specific position. Avoid applying for a position without describing exactly what particular position you seek. Never apply for just a position. That indicates you lack specialized qualifications. State your qualifications for the particular position for which you apply. Give full details as to the reason you believe you are qualified for the particular position you seek. This is the most important detail of your application. It will determine more than anything else what consideration you receive. Offer to go to work on probation. In the majority of instances, if you are determined to have the position for which you apply, it will be most effective if you offer to work for a week or a month or for a sufficient length of time to enable your prospective employer to judge your value without pay. This may appear to be a radical suggestion, but experience has proved that it seldom fails to win at least a trial. If you are sure of your qualifications, a trial is all you need. Incidentally, such an offer indicates that you have confidence in your ability to fill the position you seek. It is most convincing. If your offer is accepted and you make good, more than likely you will be paid for your probation period. Make clear the fact that your offer is based upon your confidence in your ability to fill the position. Your confidence in your prospective employer's decision to employ you after trial. Your determination to have the position you seek. Knowledge of your prospective employer's business. Before applying for a position, do sufficient research in connection with the business to familiarize yourself thoroughly with that business and indicate in your resume the knowledge you have acquired in this field. This will be impressive, as it will indicate that you have imagination and a real interest in the position you seek. Remember that it is not the lawyer who knows the most law, but the one who prepares the best case who wins. If your case is properly prepared and presented, your victory will have been more than half won at the outset. Do not be afraid of making your resume too long. Employers are just as much interested in purchasing the services of well-qualified applicants as you are in securing employment. In fact, the success of most successful employers is due mainly to their ability to select well-qualified lieutenants. They want all the information available. Remember another thing, neatness and care in the preparation of your resume will indicate that you are a painstaking person. I have helped to prepare resumes for clients which were so striking and out of the ordinary, that they resulted in the employment of the applicant without a personal interview. When your resume has been completed, have it neatly bound and printed by an experienced printer. Its cover should appear similar to the following. Resume of Robert K. Smith. Applying for the position of assistant manager at The Blank Company Incorporated. This personal touch is sure to command attention. Have your resume neatly typed or printed on the finest paper you can obtain and then suitably bound or placed in an appropriate presentation folder. The cover should, of course, be changed and the proper firm name and job title inserted if it is to be shown to more than one company. Your photograph should be pasted or printed on one of the pages of your resume. Follow these instructions to the letter, improving upon them wherever your imagination suggests. Successful salespeople groom themselves with care. They understand that first impressions are lasting, your resume is your sales representative. Give it a good suit of clothes, so it will stand out in bold contrast to anything your prospective employer ever saw in the way of an application for a position. If the position you seek is worth having, it is worth going after with care. Moreover, if you sell yourself to employers in a manner that impresses them with your individuality, you may very well receive more money for your services from the very start than you would if you applied for employment in the usual way. If you seek employment through an employment agency, make sure they use copies of your resume or produce and provide one that meets all the above criteria in marketing your services. This will help to gain preference for you both with the agency and prospective employers. 
How to get the exact position you desire. Everyone enjoys doing the kind of work for which they are best suited. An artist loves to work with paints, a craftsman with his or her hands, a writer loves to write. Those with less definite talents have their preferences for certain fields of business or industry. If America does anything well, it offers a full range of occupations, from tilling the soil and manufacturing, to marketing, commerce, and the professions. Here are seven actions to take to guarantee yourself the exact position you wish. First, decide and define briefly in writing exactly what kind of job you desire. If the job does not already exist, perhaps you can create it. Second, choose the specific company or the specific individual for whom you wish to work. Third, study your prospective employers to policies, personnel, and chances of advancement. Fourth, by analysis of yourself, your talents and capabilities, figure what you can offer, and plan ways and means of giving advantages, services, developments, and ideas that you believe you can successfully deliver. Fifth, forget about a job. Forget whether or not there is an opening. Forget the usual routine of have you got a job for me? Concentrate on what you can give. Sixth, once you have your plan in mind, arrange with an experienced writer, to put it on paper, in neat form, and in full detail. Seventh, present it to the proper person with authority and he or she will do the rest. Every company is looking for people who can give something of value, whether it be ideas, services, or connections. Every company has room for the individual who has a definite plan of action which is to the advantage of that company. This line of procedure may take a few days or weeks of extra time, but the difference in income, in advancement, and in gaining recognition will save years of hard work at small pay. It has many advantages, the main one being that it will often save from one to five years of time in reaching a chosen goal. Every person who starts or gets in halfway up the ladder does so by deliberate and careful planning, accepting, of course, the boss's kid.